This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning. It is three minutes after 10 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. How, do, how would you divide the world, do you think? Or, or at least the country, the population of this country. I think if I, when I say the word migration or immigration or emigre, which is the word I'm going to try and use instead of immigrant moving forwards, because um, I think that the word immigrant has been sullied somewhat and quite deliberately by various people. So emigre is the one that I prefer. I think you can split. Uh, we can split ourselves into three, can we? There are people who's, and I think it is an intersecting Venn diagram. Uh, all three of these circles intersect each other. Uh, goodness knows what it's like to be in the very middle when you've got um, a, a foot or a finger in each of these three camps. But I think there are three camps. I think that you have people whose heart sinks, genuinely. People who just think, oh, Lord. And I think the reason why your heart sinks is partly because of the uh, strength of feeling or the attitudes of the people in the other two camps. So today you turn on your favourite radio station, LBC, um, and your favourite presenter, Sheila Fogarty, but James O'Brien is still on. And he says, today we're going to talk about immigration. And you go, oh, flip it, heck. So that's camp number one. Camp number two is the what you might call the red meat munchers. Today we're going to talk about immigration. Before I've even got to the end of the word, you're ringing me in a state of righteous fury to complain about everything from traffic jams on the M25 through to housing shortages and uh, the length of the queues in Sainsbury's and the number of brown people on the tills in Tesco's. Ah! You think to yourself, you're absolutely furious already. You are, if you like, um, Paul Dacre's people, Rupert Murdoch's people. You, you have been very, very successfully groomed and gaslit into a position of incoherent fury at the very mention of that word, migration or immigration. Ah, Furious. And then there's the third camp of people. Possibly there's another camp, but I think this works pretty well. There is the third camp of people that thinks, oh, crikey, okay, on we go. Time to strap on my armour and um, try to fight the feelings with the facts, try to actually get to the bottom of what is true and what is not, try to steer clear of the nativist uh, gaslighting and the very unpleasant othering of our neighbours and our friends and our colleagues and our lovers as being somehow innately and inherently different just because of the sign or the flag that they were born under. I, I, and, and then possibly there's a fourth camp, which would be people who feel just as passionately about migration in a positive, uplifting sense, as the red meat munchers who are already sort of chewing their own cheeks in outrage at the very prospect of it. But I think if the fourth camp exists, the sort of passionate pro-migration people, as opposed to the passionate defenders of um, emigrates in particular and migration as a principle, I, I suspect that you or we are most likely to move into the category of our hearts. So you think, oh, do we really have to do this again? You know, you, you look at Farage in the jungle and they're already whining. It's quite incredible. They've apparently given him one and a half million quid and all his weird little lemming acolytes are now complaining that he's being censored or because that's what ITV do. They give one and a half million quid to someone to come on a television programme and then deliberately keep him off the telly. That's, that's obviously the case, isn't it? I mean, it would be mad to behave differently. Here's one and a half million pounds, but we're definitely going to work very, very hard to make sure you're not on the telly. But because he's not having a very good time or winning hearts, so he's coming over as a, as a, as a boring, bigoted man, which um, <laughs> some of us have known for a very long time, and, and that's not good telly. But because his fans have to believe that he's not a boring, bigoted man, he's the Messiah, they're now complaining. Even the Daily Mail, they're all carrying stories about it. And that is the sort of moment where you just go oh flipping heck really we're talking about this again but i think today we have to and i think today is a day where camp three becomes exceedingly important we need to actually know what the facts are and they are i I would say possibly even harder to get hold of even on this incredibly delicate and difficult subject they are even harder to get hold of than usual so bear with me for a moment i I'm, i'm going to be asking about the relationship between shortages and migration, staff shortages and migration, okay? I told you some time ago that we would be moving gently and incrementally towards something called liberty of motion, 
which is uh, exactly the same as freedom of movement with one crucial difference. It's not reciprocal. So although it would involve people from other countries being able to come here, and not just European Union countries or EEA countries, but any country under the sun, really, if somebody wanted to come here to do a job that we were struggling to fill domestically, then that would happen under liberty of motion. Um, and what would happen is that eventually the so-called shortage occupations would grow so much, there would be so many shortage occupations that eventually it would be freedom of movement in all but name, um, and the name would be liberty of motion, and that would um, that has come close to sort of happening in many ways. When you look at the immigration figures, which are currently three times what they were before everybody who knew exactly what they were voting for voted for Brexit because they wanted to reduce migration. So this is very, very interesting because I don't actually know what is best for Britain. And by that, I mean that Robert Jenrick, a particularly pungent politician, even by modern standards, did something yesterday that really speaks volumes about Rishi Sunak's weakness at the moment. He essentially came out as an immigration minister still in the Home Office as a continuity Suella Braverman, which, frankly, you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. He said the public are sick of talk on cutting immigration and called for a serious package of fundamental reforms saying, and this is where I think he does breach individual, or I beg your pardon, collective cabinet responsibility, saying that he would have done this before last Christmas if I could have done. So he is distancing himself from government policy, from cabinet policy, and therefore, I think, breaching collective cabinet responsibility. Uh, and and it's it hinges upon the idea that there are too many people coming here. And... It doesn't address, as far as I can tell, the question of, 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 of how you know that, apart from in mere numerical terms. Because one of the things that they're now arguing about, and this is on the front of the Times newspaper today, is closing the visa route for cheaper foreign staff. So the Home Office wants to scrap an immigration route that allows foreigners to be hired, emigres, I beg your pardon, to be hired to plug workforce gaps. So if you've got a proven shortage in a certain sector, there is a law in place that actually allows you to offer jobs in those shortage sectors, in those, um, what's the, 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 the correct term? You, you, I just told you what it was. Um, in, in those specific sectors where there are shortages, you are allowed to offer up to 20% less by way of a wage than what we could loosely describe as the national average. Now, I did a bit of research on this last night because there was something that was puzzling me and I couldn't put my finger on precisely what it was. And I'll tell you what it was. Before Brexit, you weren't allowed to do this. Article 45 of the um, uh, uh, freedom of the fundamental rights of the European Union, the Charter of European Union membership, Article 45 of that, it's pretty specific that you were not allowed to discriminate based on nationality as regards employment, remuneration, and other conditions of work. I just read that from, from the objectives in the Charter. So it stipulates that an EU worker has the right to accept a job offer, to stay for the purposes of employment, and to stay on afterwards under certain conditions. But it also stipulates that you cannot offer a measurably lower wage to somebody coming here specifically to work in a specific sector than the wage that is available to a domestic worker, to a homegrown worker, to, a, to an applicant or, or an employee who is already here. So they've changed that. That, that is, um, I think that is a consequence of Brexit. I wouldn't be surprised, and I can't quite remember, if it had been offered up initially as a Brexit benefit. Oh, look, what we can do now. Um, we can offer cheaper foreign workers jobs in Britain, which, if you remember, in 2015 and 2016, was one of the reasons offered to you for voting in favour of Brexit. We've got to vote for Brexit because it will stop cheaper foreign workers coming over here. Well, that was actually against the law under European Union membership. The law has been changed and it is now perfectly permissible to allow employers to hire foreign workers at 20% below the going rate 
in their industry if they are in a shortage sector. Um, and that, that includes dozens of jobs, dozens of sectors across a wide range of industries. So bricklayers, engineers, care workers, uh, ballet dancers, graphic designers, arts officers, shortage occupations is a long, long list of jobs that we cannot fill. And therefore, in order to try to fill them, we are allowed to offer those jobs at 20% below the market rate to people from any other country under the sun. And that is part of the reason, perhaps, why net migration currently stands at 745,000. But remember, in 2016, absolutely everybody knew exactly what they were voting for, and it is very condescending to suggest otherwise. So how do we make sense of this together? I'm not 100% sure, but I think the first question to ask is, what would happen? What would happen? What would happen if the ability to fill these gaping vacancies was compromised, if it was made even harder to fill these roles by repealing this legislation that actually makes a complete mockery of Brexiters' claims that voting to leave the European Union would stop foreign workers coming here to undercut Britain. We've enshrined it in law, foreign workers coming here, um, not to undercut, actually, because the vacancies are not being filled at, even at the going rate. So it's a temptation for employers to take advantage of this legislation. And now Rishi Sunak's Conservative Party is dividing along these lines to scrap a route that allows foreigners to be hired to plug workforce gaps. And listen, the Migration Advisory Committee, who are worth listening to, have urged the ditching of this shortage occupation list. So what would happen if that happened? 0345 6060973. It wouldn't, just to address a couple of questions that have already come in, it wouldn't affect, it wouldn't be affected by national minimum wage legislation because the the, the, the reduced figure, the 20% below the going rate figure, needs to be higher still than um, the minimum wage legislation. But what I want to know really, and I, I've tried to work out once, we did this once, and, it, and, and the, the phones didn't ring off the hook, and I couldn't work out why, because they almost always do on this show. And, and I realised that you might not realise I'm talking about you, but anybody who has a payroll, anybody who pays another human being to do a job, is qualified to contribute to this conversation. It doesn't even have to be a, um, a an area where there are shortages. It just needs to be an area where there are vacancies. And I want to know, I don't know who can answer the second question. The first question is really easy. How bad is the vacancy situation at the moment? 0345 How hard is it for any employer to fill vacancies? And then we come to the scary bit, which is for largely political reasons. Conservative politicians like Robert Jenrick want to make, for example, the care sector even more vulnerable to vacancies. If you can't go down this shortage route, if you can't bring in foreign workers because they're so desperate to reduce the overall figures, you can't bring in foreign workers to work, for example, as a care worker then what happens? And what happens? I, I, I think the vacancies that I saw, I think it adds up to about a quarter of a million. If you add the NHS to the care sector, you're looking at about a quarter of a million vacancies, unfilled roles in the NHS and in the care sector. And if Robert Jenrick gets his way, and one current route by which we can address some of those vacancies is closed, what would actually happen? So there are two constituencies of caller this hour. The first is an employer trying to fill jobs. Any employer in any sector trying to fill jobs. How hard is it? And if you fancy it, you can add a Y to that as well. 0345 6060 973. How hard is it to fill vacancies? Brackets and Y question mark, close brackets. 
But the second one is this. If, if, if it is one of these occupations that has the special exemption, if it is one of these occupations, and you will know this because of the nature of, of your work, if you are in a, 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 a position to offer jobs to foreign workers at up to 20% below the going rate, what happens if that path is closed? That that is that's quite a cocky question for a phone in program because I'm I'm speaking to a very specific constituency of employer who may have better things to do than ring me or may not fancy sharing the details of your current commercial situation live on national radio. But I implore you to do so because if you don't, we all suffer from ignorance we all suffer from confusion and we leave the dance floor clear for the the gammon maypoles uh that we discussed last week after the appointment of Esther McVeigh I want to know the facts well I want to know the reality of your lived experience as a employer who either struggles to fill vacancies 03456060973 or currently benefits from or is relevant to the shortage occupation list what would happen if that was closed 03456060973 and listen i can't guarantee this and i may well fall at the first hurdle myself but i like to have conversations about migration that focus more on facts than feelings but i can only do that with your help so what is the broad vacancy situation in this country how bad is it and what would happen to your business if they shut the shortage occupation list and stopped you being able to recruit overseas in the way that you currently do oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three it's 20 past 10 james o'brien on lbc it's a funny one, isn't it? When you actually focus on the facts and figures, it's a very, very different conversation from the one that you might have when you focus on the feelings. Carolyn puts it very powerfully. I'm the deputy manager of a care home in Hounslow. We have 75 employees. Only four are British born. If it wasn't for emigres, that's not the word she uses, but that's the word I'm using, henceforth, we wouldn't be able to care for our residents. When we have vacancies, we advertise on job sites such as Indeed, and very rarely do British people apply. We have hired some people using the scheme you mentioned. This is the um, uh, shortage occupation list. Uh, and offer sponsorship to those who were successful at interview, I can assure you that the carers we brought in are paid the exact same wage as our pre-existing staff. That's because you're good bosses. Um, but you would be free to pay them 20% less, which you wouldn't have been free to do with European Union workers before Brexit. And that that's what is kind of scary to me. Robert Jenrick and Suella Braverman make these noises about cutting numbers and how important it is. And Carolyn gives us a little glimpse of what life might be like for the residents of her care home if the numbers were cut i don't i don't I, I can't marry these two things together i understand why red meat munchers are freaked out by the 745,000 net migration figure but we are living in a country where vacancies in crucial sectors are at unprecedentedly high levels so anyway you you try you try and make that twain meet uh imad is in epsom imad what would you like to say Hi, good morning. Hello. Uh, I, I, I'm a restaurant manager and I work with many different kind of uh, small businesses in different capacities from consultant to hands-on. Yes. And in our industry, the part that's uh, covered by that legislation is mainly chefs. We can't, for example, bring waiters under, uh, under work visas. Okay. Now, uh, the reason I called in this morning, because literally a couple of days ago, I have an employee, uh, a lovely young lady who's been with me for a couple of years now. Yeah. And uh, she's a university student. Uh, she's allowed to work. She, she's here on a student visa. So she's, she's allowed 20 hours a week. So I've spent two years training her yeah. uh, as a waitress. And she's found some work in her own area. She's studying law. Okay. And she wants to leave the business. Right. I can't replace her. 20 hours, just to cover 20 hours a week in my restaurant, I cannot replace this employee at the moment. How hard? I, I mean, have, f this, isn't a, this isn't a question. I just realized my question was going to sound slightly aggressive, Imad, but it's not intended to be. I want to know how hard you've tried to 
to replace her. But I was I was going to go. How hard have you tried? And that would have sounded like I was accusing that's, you of being lazy. Fine. But that's but fine. no, you fine. understand fine. what but I'm saying. But, but just to give you a general idea, yes. how small this this area of the business is in London. I have on my phone probably every competent, experienced waiter in the, in the Lebanese sector in, in London. Yes. Across all of London. So you, you need people. Small world. I mean, part of and the problem here is that it is actually a skilled job. I, I spoke to um, Fred Syriax about this, not not specifically about the Lebanese restaurants, but Fred, Fred, who's in the jungle at the moment, of course, is, is a very good ambassador for why front of house is a skilled sector, even though it's not recognised as such by this legislation. So you 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 need someone who knows what they're doing, because otherwise the quality of offering that you're making to your customers will diminish measurably. Exactly, because customer retention, everything that goes hand in hand with that, is covered by the front of house. Yeah. So while a lot of other businesses, basically, and this is common in our industry, they will say that, let's say we're bringing in a sous chef from outside of the country. Yes. And then employ him as a as a waiter in, in, in reality. Sure. The, the place I'm working for at the moment is one of the very few places I know that is trying to do everything by the book, by, by the law, by the book fully. Yeah. So managing that has been a nightmare. We're kind of preparing for expansion. We were hoping to kind of franchise the brand. We're building it up in such a positive way. Yes. But our biggest hurdle, the reason we haven't taken that step, is simply employees. We cannot get competent employees to fill all the staff positions. Because they don't really I exist. Have, I mean, it's not... I, I have mean, a I, massive list on. of CVs on my yeah. email. You asked about how hard I've tried. Yes. I have at least 50, 60 CVs in a, in a, in a folder on my email that are potential employees, all of them are willing to work, all of them uh, are able to give the hours. None of them have a, a jot of experience in the industry altogether. They can't hold a tray, sure. never mind uh, understand Lebanese cuisine. And if you take a couple on and train them up, they might be gone by Christmas and you've wasted your time and been left with big holes in your workforce. What, what, how long have you been in, the, in, not necessarily in this specific job, but how long have you been in this line of work? Uh, I started in this industry uh, quite young. I, I used to work just over the weekend when I was literally 16 years old. It was a part-time Imad, job. And I, 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 I have, Imad, I have Imad, several Imad, kids it, doing that at the moment. <laughs> I don't know how old you are now, so that's not very old. I'm 35. I'm 35. I've been, <laughs> you I've might been be 17. <laughs> You've only been, to, I've been so, in this industry about 20 years now. Okay, and, and when did things go like badly wrong? When did you find yourself in a situation where you honestly couldn't find staff, however hard you looked? Uh, I think Brexit is a big part of it. The thing is, uh, the way European people used to look at the UK, you used to get a big influx of employees in the summer. So they, they, these are university students from across, uh, from across Europe. But they wouldn't be where, trained up or, or, or au fait with Lebanese cuisine necessarily, would they? You'd be surprised because a lot okay. of them were uh, working, let's say, in pubs over the winter in their own countries. Right. A lot of them. So, so even though it might not be specific to the Lebanese cuisine, they, they know do what have to do. They know how to look after the customers. Restaurant. They know how to hold the tray, how to talk to them. A lot of them had good English. And a lot of them Very were sure. coming rep- repeatedly every year. It wasn't just the one-off. So they used to make this extra income over the summer because of the slightly higher exchange rate in the UK. And, and yeah, and we've heard that from other sectors, you know, it, uh, most obviously, I suppose, agricultural. F- final question. What does the light at the end of the tunnel look like for you? What, what I mean, what does... Oh, I can relax now. If things are back to how they were in 2014, what does that look like? I have no idea, no, to I be completely know. honest with you. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so it's more of a round call that, than to actually give solutions, to be honest. But, no, uh, that's what we need. Nutshell, the way things are going at the moment, uh, we're talking about, as I said, th- th- this is a, a restaurant that has been built in such a way at the moment that it's ready for expansion. Yes. And the only, the only hurdle, the only block we have that's stopping us from uh, taking on more locations and expanding and so on is the fact we cannot get stuff. It's incredible, so, isn't it? And yeah, yeah. And, and to be fair, I, I understand. We, I'm not going to malign them as being red meat munchers. I think perfectly reasonable people will be listening to you and looking at the figure of 745,000 um, net migration last year and wondering how, how these two phenomena can coexist simultaneously. How can there be... So many people coming here, regardless of how many people there may be already here, and so many employers like you struggling to to find the staff that you need. It, I guess in, a, in, its, in its simplest terms, that number there does not include the kind of young people that used to 
keep your business buzzing, that used to keep your business bubbling over, particularly during the, the, the high season periods, the seasonal Look, peaks? I, I, I can't give you the answer from the other side of the coin because, mm. uh, as I said, as part of my work, I do work with different restaurants yes. across London. Uh, a lot of places, basically, we're talking about, you, you need to ask yourself, these people coming into the UK, how are they making ends meet? Yeah. You do have people, uh, the, the, the other side of it, the, the actual immigration, yes. uh, they, they are going, some of them, into this industry as well. There are a lot of places that are willing to take on employees because they have no choice. Yes. Nobody wants to employ someone without papers and so on. But if it's a, if it's a but choice, pe- people will do. But this is this is no, well, this is net migration though. This isn't the black market stuff. This is people with visas and with specific, particularly in in the shortage sectors, with with specific jobs already lined up, um, or family members, or students, or of course Ukrainian or Hong Kong. So, Imad, do you want to mention the name of the restaurant? It sounds like, it sounds like you're onto a winner. Uh, our restaurant is called Ruba Restaurant and it's in Tennington. Fantastic. It's not that far from me. I may see you. Uh, Imad, thank you very much. 10.32 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Thomas Watts is here now with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, the time now is 10.36 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the gulf between feelings and facts when it comes to conversations about migration has Oddly, rarely felt bigger. It's almost as if all those people who were told that voting to leave the European Union and become the first population in the history of humanity to impose economic sanctions on itself hasn't delivered the nativist boost that they were promised it would deliver. Um, and, 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 and of course, it continues because people like Kemi Badenoch and Robert Jenrick and Suella Braverman and others understand what you might describe as the Farage factor that by wanging on endlessly about the need to reduce immigration and completely ignoring arguments about why that may be suboptimal to the national interest um, is politically advantageous. It, it, it wins you support among a shrinking but still very significant portion of the population. So we find ourselves today, even Thomas had it in his news bulletin, learning of conflict within the cabinet itself. Remember, this is a cabinet built entirely upon the nativist lies of Brexit. Rishi Sunak, the third prime minister in a row, propelled into Downing Street by his very disingenuous and dishonest support for the ludicrous idea of leaving the European Union, built largely upon a promise to reduce migration, which has tripled since. And now they're arguing with each other about whether they should make more promises to cut it. The question then is simple. What what would happen? How hard is it to fill jobs now, and what would happen if they made it even harder? Neil is in Western Supermare. Neil, what would you like to say? Hi, James. We've spoken before um, about social care. That's the sector that you are in? Yes, yeah, very much so, yeah. I mean, I've worked across the board for 20-odd years in social care, working right up to a director level. But we, we, I... Um, decided to make partly because of this part uh, the decision to go and set up for ourselves. Yes, um, we we're a much smaller outfit than, than than other people. But part of the reason what we did is that is because of difficulty to employ. Um, mm. So we set up smaller and set up as a as a non profit, so we can share profits with people that that work for us. Okay, that's um, nice. is is a is a different way of trying to encourage people into social care and. The, the the interesting thing about social care is because local authorities, because of austerity, local authorities are forced into the situation of of going to the cheapest provider. Um, and quite often those cheapest providers are big. They used to be big trusts, but quite often now they're quite often the hedge fund um, organizations yeah. and companies which which come in and they do a lot of recruiting so i've worked for them they do recruiting abroad and well every like every free. pound they save on wages is a pound they yeah. get to keep isn't it and and they uh, take absolutely. it and although that's true of course of any employer in 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 the strictest sense you speak as someone who understands what you might describe as non-financial goods and non-financial Completely. pluses yeah because social care has relied for many many years on, on people's goodwill um, you know, and, and you, you get you get the old adage: people going, "Oh God, you must be a saint. You must be going and doing this." Mm. Now, this this was a chosen career for an awful lot of people, and then what happens is people come into it, that goodwill is taken out, and then they're, they're or it's they they can't pay their bills, <laughs> and, and they're forced into the situation of working. So where are we now? I, I mean, it, well, you, you you turn on your radio this morning and you hear that the, yeah. there are members of the cabinet determined to make it harder to hire foreign workers. What's your gut reaction to that news? That headline. Well, it's a two-edged sword because I, I think we should be looking for more innovation. 
when yes. it comes to social care. And the problem we've got is that they're going to big, larger organisations which do things cheaply um, on on a on a grain. You know, there are some good, there's some bad. So, so although I I largely dislike most things that the Tory party do, yes, um, it almost if it forced them into the situation where they're going to have to invest more money because they, we social uh, social care providers are no longer going to be able to actually function, then that almost oh, it, it, it could be a good positive come here, come here, from, from, from it come, doing come, it. I, mean, actually, I, want, no, come here. I want to go, I want, I want you to be Ernie Wise. Yeah. All right? And I, I'm going to be Eric Morecambe. Yeah. And, I, and I'm just going to get your little cheeks and I'm going to go like this. There we go. Because I love that idea. I love the idea yeah. that what they're going to do is by making it much harder to bring workers here who post-Brexit they've been allowed to hire at, <laughs> yeah. at, at 20% below the going rate. The Tories are now going to ramp up investment in the care sector and rise, raise the wages of everybody in order to ensure that we can have a much um, clearer <laughs> conveyor belt from, from college yeah, to the care. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about the Conservative Party, Neil. Yeah. Well, the, the, only, the only thing is is that there was, there was a, a camera, I wish I'd remembered the name, there was a Tory politician being being interviewed on the radio the other day, I was on LBC, mm. I think, and that question was was put to them. Yeah, and yes. and um and it, and it said that you know by the by politics it means that you're going to have to actually pay more yeah. for providers and all the rest of it. And that politician said, well, if that's what we if that's you know if that's what we've got to do in order to to get this policy through because we completely believe in this policy and yeah. you know because it's part of their their failed you know philosophy. Um, you know, then, then that's what is, we'll do, like, even though it's the same government that introduced yeah, yeah. post-Brexit legislation yeah. to allow the care sector to hire foreign workers at 20% below the going rate. The problem here is that you're struggling to find people even at the going rate. Oh, completely, yeah. So we're not completely. even ta- we're not talking about if you get rid of the foreign workers at 20%, then the jobs will be done at the going rate by British workers. We'd have to yeah. increase it for everybody, and I can't increase it just to tempt in the people that aren't doing it now. I'd have to increase it for the people who are currently doing it at the going rate. Yeah. Well, because it's it's a minimum wage job largely. You get there or thereabouts, um, you get sort of a ten percent increase. Right, it must be twenty percent. It must be wage. up to twenty percent more than minimum wage because it, even under the yeah, yeah. protected well, short, shortage occupation list, you you couldn't pay less than the minimum wage. I don't think. No, no, no. Of of course, and that's that's it depends on which sector because children's yeah um, the children's sector actually pays more because of the um, diff- because of the way that um, it's fun yeah, it's funded in things but we specifically around people with learning difficulties you don't you don't have that same thing you don't have um, people being born how, how, to do those jobs I mean how do you put numbers on it now so I said to Imad who's a restaurateur yeah. what does the light at the end of the tunnel look like and he's got no idea anymore what does the light <laughs> at the end what does the light at the end of your tunnel look like I very much doubt that the light is a in, in the shape of honest Bob Jenrick, but who knows? Well, it's 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 a it's um, the total and utter destruction of the Tory party. But that, that that's the only thing that's going to deliver the level I, of attention. I, I, I can't care. think of any. I cannot think of anything. You know, I cannot see any hope underneath. underneath you give us another. It's government. another instance, isn't it? And you, we constantly yeah. forget this. These people have been in charge for thirteen years. Yeah, and everything yeah. they are describing is a consequence of the decisions they've already made, and they're saying, "Trust us, yeah. trust us to I, fix I was, it." I was shouting, you know, that those those are that were pro Brexit mm. back in 2014, 15. Were shouting this exact same thing. Said, "This is where we were heading. Yeah. This is what this is what's going to happen." Um, you know, that that's why there's so much bitterness and anger because you're just saying, "Look, we told you so," but. And there you know, it is. Well, we never say, "I told you so" on this program. It's too expensive, Neil. Since um, we. Uh, promised to put 50p in Keith's tin every time he said the words out loud. I wish you well. It's crazy. I, I mean, the rhetoric continues. Thank you, Neil. The rhetoric continues. We promise that we'll cut it. That, that's the bit. I, I wonder if anyone wants to have a crack at unravelling that, that sort of philosophical tension between continuing promises from politicians who've spent 13 years promising to cut migration and rocketing vacancies in all sorts of sectors. It makes very little sense. Martin's in Brighton. Martin, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning, James. So I'm slightly, slightly nervous to speak on the radio. I've never phoned in. <laughs> it's, it's only um, me, Martin. You'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> Very good of you. Um, if I could make two points, possibly. The, the, the main point, I'm, I'm a veterinary surgeon. I came from Germany to this country 25 years ago in 98. Yeah. England used to be very attractive for my colleagues. Lots of people who went to uni with me are now in England as well. Yes. People from Spain. From, there's, 
there's never been enough English vets. Now I'm I'm part owner of a small practice in Brighton, and recently we needed to fill a vacancy for a qualified vet because one of our very very good Polish vets left. Yes. And we advertised, and we didn't get any applications, and we spoke to our accountant. Oh, not one, not did. one, not one application. And to, to begin with, no, we, we got a little bit lucky in the end because we are the only privately owned. Right. Practice. Nobody works for the wants to work for the corporate. So we got lucky in the end. We got two applications, um, and we employed both of them. <laughs> this one vet from uh, Portugal who's been in the country for 12 years and one English vet. But our accountants told us average application rate. If other vets uh, uh, apply for uh, uh, basically offer a job, the average number of applications they get is zero to one. There's no one out there. It's extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's really ridiculous. And we always had vets coming from France, from Germany, particularly Portugal, Spain. That's more or less dried up entirely since Brexit, of course. It, it's, I, 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 it, well, also, you've got this thing now that they're saying, which is really ugly, is that, well, you know, we can perhaps offer people jobs here. We can start trying to recruit again from the countries that you described. But, uh, and they've already said this about the care sector, you won't be able to bring your family. You won't be able to bring your dependents. So... In a way, yeah. the, the more skilled the job is, the more obnoxious that invitation becomes, doesn't it? It's like, you can I mean, come that, here, you that can work. Complete, that what? would be a complete deal-breaker for someone yes, who has a young child. Would. Of course it and, would. And, and vets are overwhelmingly female. I think about 70-80% of the position... I didn't know are, that. Is are, that true? By, by females, they are caring by nature. Why would they leave their children behind for <laughs> getting a lower wage? It would be, <laughs> there's no I've, need for that. I've, I've, I'm only laughing because you put it so neatly. Uh, and, and that is what people like Robert Jenrick think is likely to happen. And uh, just out of interest, wh- wh- why are there so few? Why do, why do we train so few here? Because we had become so reliant upon freedom of movement. I, I guess so. There's, yeah. there's, well, they've opened more vet schools now, so they're trying to turn on more vets in this country. And, and English vet schools are excellent. They've got a fantastic yes. reputation. They turn out very high quality. That's where it takes five or six years to make one. <laughs> and again, because there's many women in the profession who make excellent vets, again, unfortunately, because they're caring, they tend to want to have families. At some and and they have flexi time and, and leaving, the, leaving the industry. But again, just this is reality. These are facts, and they, they don't seem to bear any relationship whatsoever to the kind of feelings that people like Robert Jenrick and, and Suella Braverman are trying to provoke. Uh, Martin, thank you. I, and, I mean, it is actually, I, I know we go on about it a bit, but it is kind of important. It is increasingly obvious, isn't it, that there were elements of, of abolishing freedom of movement that were absolutely stupid. That's increasingly evident. You just hear something as simple as that. I'm a vet. I've got a vet's practice in Brighton. Need to hire some vets. And somebody who's just qualified in Dusseldorf or Lisbon or wherever it may be, Krakow, somebody is looking at the, the, the website. Of, and they thought, oh, crikey, Brighton's a lovely part of the world. Do you fancy Do you fancy a few years in Brighton? And, and you just do it. You just apply. And I think that many Brits struggle to understand that outward-looking attitude because most of us don't move in the other direction. Most of us don't look at job vacancies across the whole of Europe. Most of us, largely perhaps because we were limited by language, we'd look only at job vacancies in our own country. But we shut the doors, we pulled up the drawbridge, we dropped the portcullis on people who would look at a website, a vet, a fully qualified vet, looking for a new position, and we've we've shut the gates to Brighton. And Martin, therefore, struggles to find people to fill jobs. And every vet in the country struggles to find people to fill vacancies. And yet... They want to make it harder for people to come here to do jobs exactly like veterinary surgeon. It doesn't make any sense. Or at least I can't see any sense in it. If you can, 0345 973 It's 1048. James O'Brien on LBC. 1052 is the time. Call to close visa route for cheaper foreign staff. And I, I've, I've, um, I've let you down again, actually, by focusing upon, if you like, the pre-Brexit shortage occupation idea although we didn't need a shortage occupation list pre-brexit because we had freedom of movement some of the jobs on this list include scientists and and it's actually martin in brighton that prompted me to check this scientists engineers architects managers actuaries veterinarians it business analysts so i mean (laughs) is there any sector that's not in dire straits with regard to shortages with regard to staffing shortages and it seems highly unlikely that there there are any that aren't in dire straits, and the government remains dedicated to 
promising the population that it will continue to reduce the number of people coming here from overseas, while also reducing the amount of spending on, quote, training our own, end quotes. It's, it, it just feels, and remember, I'm the bloke that wrote a book called How They Broke Britain, but it almost feels as if we've gone beyond that now and as if we're in some sort of alternative universe um, full of what Kellyanne Conway would call alternative facts. Jan's in Stafford. Jan, what would you like to say? Good morning. Thank Hello, you for Jan. having me on. You're very well. Um, I worked in recruitment for the last 20 years as a recruitment manager, one sector for, uh, for healthcare, yes. being in the agency world um, where the company that I worked for had 28 divisions up and down the country Crikey. employing agency staff to provide healthcare into the NHS, care homes and into um, a private home, if you yes. like. I also then, in the last three years, worked for a large, co- uh, large company that owned nursing homes, okay. um, so care homes and nursing homes. The recruitment has always, always been difficult. And yes. I remember going back to 2010, so way before Brexit, we would advertise through many mediums, um, put our adverts out there, we would have many people apply, yeah. and sometimes we would have back-to-back interviews booked in all day long. We'd probably see two people. People, people just, just wouldn't turn up. Don't turn up. Now, whether that came down to they had a better offer, they'd applied yeah. for three jobs, they'd gone for one, or whether it was part of the unemployment system where you had to prove that you'd applied for a job, you got your appointment. Even if it's even if it's neither a job you want nor have any intention of taking, you have to apply for it so they can t- tick a box in what we used to call the job centre, and you carry Correct. on to get your universal credit. It's just a stupid Correct. system, yeah, from, it, from any angle. Um, we also employed um, so in the large company that I worked for originally with yeah. agency, we had three branches down in uh, down south in the London area, and the majority of the staff that we employed were foreign nationals. Uh, right. Back in the day when they needed to have a visa to come into the country, they were given rights to work, um, they were restricted, and those workers were amazing. They, yes. they turned up, they were great, they added value, um, they were great to manage, some of those being nurses that had converted, did their nursing course abroad, they'd come to the UK, they'd done their conversion, um, but there's still a massive high turnover, sure. huge, huge turnover in care. In the re- recent three years working within the nursing home sector, it's just got incredibly hard. And actually, the best time that we had um, for recruitment was when we had COVID because really? people could take a second job. Oh, so if I they've been furloughed, yeah. they could take a second job. We had applications coming out of our ears, and it was a brilliant time, absolutely brilliant time. Oh, I never. It makes perfect right. sense when you explain it like that. But, of course, as soon as the furlough ends, so does the flow the of people. workers. And the, the, yeah, I mean, pe- people that wanted two incomes, they, they were so motivated people, who, rather than I sitting agree. at home and getting paid, they, were, they wanted to go out and do another job. They did. And, again, we then started to see real struggles with mm. people applying for jobs, just getting people to apply and the the hardest areas that we found because most of our nursing homes were rural yes was if that nursing home or if that care home is out in the sticks not on a bus route not near a train route yes. there's only a certain pool of staff that you can or a certain pool of people that you can pull from that are caring that want to be in a caring nature that want to work um, in that environment then you're starting to go a little bit wider afield well if they're working in a nursing home, they don't necessarily get mileage. As if you no. work in Tesco's, you don't get mileage to go to work and you don't get mileage back. But that then shortens the pool of people that you can try and pull. Then you're having to look at agency, which then increases the cost. Yeah, of course it so does. Those um, people then that would apply to you in that substantive role and are being paid X amount of pounds per hour over and above the national living wage would then go to agency. One, they can pick and choose when they want to work. And two, they're going to get paid more. Plus, they also get their mileage. So it has... Well, it's, a no, it's a no-brainer. What, what do you feel then, Jan? Or what do you hear when you turn your radio on and you're uh, hearing from another politician saying that he wants to make it harder for people to come here to do these jobs? 
Um, I do personally feel that there are enough people um, in the UK. I, I don't think that anybody should be stopped from, if they have the skill set, and to be a carer, all you've got to do is be honest, be reliable and care. So what's stopping them now from doing these jobs? I just think people don't want to. I think they realised that when it came to COVID, prior to COVID, everybody thought being a carer is going to sit, you have a cup of tea, you have you play Scrabble, you know, you might assist somebody to make their lunch, you might push the hoover around for them. In COVID, it blew it wide open and actually everybody went, let's clap for the carers, let's clap for the nurses. They're doing this, they're giving meds, they're doing that, they're doing appointments, they're looking after dementia patients in yes. their own home, they're looking well, after... I, I don't know, though. And actually, what, I they heard... blew, yeah, they but this, the job open and well, they no, I get it. that, and I heard that from hospitality as well, in that people decided they wanted to have more more sociable hours and they didn't want to do the late nights. But, but, but I don't agree with you. Where, where are all? What are all these people doing that could be working as carers? Because I, I, they're certainly not choosing to live the life of Riley on eighty pound a week universal credit. So where are they all? All the people that could be carers by this time next week, if only we could motivate them a bit more. I think there's a lot more people living on a lot more than eighty pounds a week. Oh, you're one of and those. It, no, no, it's incredibly oh, okay. hard. It, no, uh, no, no, how no, much really, research? No. How much research have you done into the numbers? No, no, really. I, no, no, really. Um, how much? I do think there's. It, no, I know what you think. I said, how much do you know? How much research have you done into what it's like to live on 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 universal credit at the moment? Um, I, I'm understanding of the figures. So what are they? Uh, um, I'm, I'm understanding of the figures. I'm understanding... What are they? That I'm, I'm understanding of the figures. And what I'm going to say to you is, right. if there is somebody... So this is what's doing your industry me, down. Please, no, no, please let me... Let, please let me well, I've, li- I've listened to you for seven minutes. I, I'm just saying, what is doing your industry down is the belief that there are loads of British people out there who could be doing this job if only the benefit system wasn't so generous. It's the least no, generous no, no. it's been in your no, lifetime. No, no, no. no yes, no, yes, no. yes. What, no, what I'm actually trying to say to you is... There are people that are on benefits. For them to come off of benefits, yes. get the child's care, to get the support, to get the bus fares, to get everything that they need, bearing in mind they're not going to be paid for a month, um, is incredibly hard because they're only going to get a fraction more if they're working a, a short hours. If they've got children, they're stuck at home. They, they can't afford the childcare to take the child into clubs. They've got to finish at half past three. They can't afford the £15 an hour childcare. So how are you going to fix that? Well, that's down to the government, isn't it? Well, it yeah, I, but the problem... Magic well, I'll I'm tell you, hang on. I, we the pro- really struggle but, in the healthcare yeah, recruitment but, but for think, all of these But think reasons. about this. Think about this. The problem, actually, is that as they reduce welfare payments, they reduce real-term payment as well, real-term wages as well. So you're never going to have the higher wages that you need to attract people into the sector unless you actually have higher welfare payments. The idea that, that really low welfare payments somehow contribute to shortages in sectors is, is one of the ugliest illustrations. I'm not accusing you of ugliness, but it's one of the ugliest illustrations of the lack of logic that often typifies these kind of conversations. Um, it, it, wages are so low that the pittance that you might get on benefits if you've got uh, dependents you've got family you've got rent to pay the pittance that you might get um still makes it a question of whether or not it's worth going and doing 40 hours a week that's that's a mark of wages being too low and benefits being too low not the other way around but hey hey i, I think you've left the sector now jan because it was getting so hard to recruit people it was it was incredibly hard and, and it got and incredibly yet the government stressful. want to make it harder well it got incredibly hard it got incredibly stressful there's, you cannot operate um, any level of care, be it nursing home, NHS, care home, or in the home, without safe measures of staffing. You cannot do it. And, uh, and, and yet they're going to. You've good. taken me up to three minutes past eleven, so it's a, a, a compliment to how much I enjoyed listening to you. The time now just coming up to three minutes past eleven. James O'Brien on LBC. It's six minutes after 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I told you this was going to happen. I said to you yesterday, this is a little bit weird because he's created a situation out of absolutely nothing. And it's a situation that is only going to do him harm. I know that I sometimes give the impression that my applicants, my daily applicants for inclusion in Idiot's Corner are not a welcome 
uh, part of the programme. On the contrary, they're crucial contributors because I have to rely more and more on Idiot's Corner to get an idea of what the um, what the red meat munchers are thinking. And it was clear very quickly that none of the people who have been wrong about everything since 2016 were, were doing what Rishi Sunak wanted them to do with regards to him cancelling his meeting with the Greek Prime Minister. It, the, the consensus on yesterday's programme, if you missed it, was that Sunak was trying to appeal to the kind of people that think Suella Braverman is a decent politician, trying to appeal to the kind of people who think that um, uh, publishing the history of National Trust properties at National Trust properties is woke or worrying or damaging because the history will include some unsavoury truths about where the money with which that building was built had come from, most obviously slavery and sugar plantations. So I'm pretty sure that what Rishi Sunak was trying to do was rile up a, a kind of anti-foreigner feeling and a culture war feeling. Two separate things. Number one, those pesky Greeks telling us what to do, Yanni Zenos coming over here and trying to nick our marbles, but also um, challenging the idea that Britain had the right, or Britons had the right to waltz around the world, helping themselves to national treasures from other countries. That, 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 that was helpful. That second bit, I think, was, was more of uh, in, illuminating for me than even the first bit, because if you see it in the context of Colston, if you see him in the context of National Trust Properties, if you see it in the context of these completely manufactured culture wars, then what, what they do is seek to defend the idea that Britannia rules the waves, Britannia waves the rules. We are somehow superior. We are somehow uh, innately better. This is, I think, pretty much a textbook definition of jingoism. And therefore, of course, we've got the right to keep Greek national treasures. Of course, we've got to ro- the right to keep stuff that was effectively looted from one of the great heritage sites of the last 3,000 years. And that is what I think Sunak was appealing to. I'm not even sure that he realised that was what he was doing. I think it's now become a kind of lazy reflex to uh, inflate this jingoistic notion that no one's allowed to tell us what to do. We're British. I mean, Brexit's built entirely on that, isn't it? No one's allowed to tell us what to do. We're British. And and it has failed completely. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, rather than it being a sort of dead cat that was going to diminish in significance as the news cycle developed, it has overnight become a much more important story than it ever should have been permitted to be. You have people pointing out that Greece is a NATO ally. We have snubbed, for the sake of a apparently a conversation about some statuary in the British Museum, that's going to have to end up in Greece at some point, whether permanently or temporarily or through some sort of job share um, scheme, we've managed to offend a NATO ally and quite possibly, as many reports contend this morning, compromise relationships with the European Union. And it is frankly remarkable that he has done so. The word that popped up yesterday, there were two words that popped up yesterday, petulant probably just edged it, although cowardly came up very fast in the second half of the conversation to describe the reasoning, the personality factors behind what Rishi Sunak did when he cancelled a meeting with Kyriakos Mitsotakis. Um, petulance and cowardice seem to be the, 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 the watchwords. I want to move the conversation on a little bit today. And the first question I'd like to ask you is why has this backfired? Because you even have members of his own cabinet, in fact, even publicly. So Robert Jenrick breaching collective cabinet responsibility on his ludicrous migration suggestions is very much of a piece with senior politicians, senior conservative politicians, not being shy to say in public that they think this was a a very silly thing to do. They think this was an odd and foolish decision to take. So why did it backfire? This is more political analysis than than statue-based conversation. Why did it backfire? Rishi Sunak clearly thought, on some level, petulance aside, that sticking up two fingers at the Greek Prime Minister would play well with a certain uh, a certain constituency of his support. It would play, and I'm thinking more in Parliament rather than 
outside parliament. I'm not even thinking about the red meat munchers in the shires at the moment. I'm thinking really about his own party, the people who are mourning the departure, the second sacking of Suella Braverman. I'm pretty sure that he thought this would play well with them. So why has the decision to, and I want you to think about this, and there's going to be room to come at it from the perspective of where the marbles should end up, because we didn't really go into that yesterday. So we can go into that today. But why has this backfired on him so spectacularly? Why has this ended up winning support from practically nowhere? If you do support it, feel free to give me a ring and tell me why. 03456060973. But, you know, even listening to people who are in the business of essentially tickling the toes of the Tories, whatever they do, uh, it, it's very hard to detect any support whatsoever for Sunak's decision to cancel a scheduled meeting with a with an ally and a, 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 not just, you know, an EU member and a NATO ally because he was cross that the Greek Prime Minister reiterated a policy position that the Greeks have held for the best part of a century. Why did it backfire so spectacularly? Hit those numbers now and you will get through. 03456060973. Imagine for a moment that the Germans had been successful in the Second World War and had invaded the United Kingdom and had taken over these islands. And during that period, they had sold the entire contents of the uh, National Gallery to various potentates and aristocrats from, from across the world. And then, thankfully, the doughty resistance in these islands managed to overthrow the Nazis um, at some point, let's say, in the 1980s. And a lot of people who had had their art stolen, or rather a lot of institutions and individuals who had had their art sold by the Nazis to various uh, potentates and plutocrats around the world wanted to get their art back. And that's the position that Greece finds itself in. An occupying force sold its national treasures to an aristocrat who uh, wanted to build a private museum. His own financial situation saw him then have to sell it to the National Museum. And Greece, having overthrown its oppressors, effectively, I'm paraphrasing history slightly, want, want their want their treasures back. If the Nazis had looted Jewish art... Well, they did loot Jewish art, but if they had then sold it, if they'd sold the looted Jewish art to other people, which I think they did, would you really argue that the people who bought the looted artworks that were previously owned by Jews in in Germany, would you really argue that it belongs to the people that bought it because of the circumstances in which the transaction took place? It's quite incredible quite incredible that that people are prepared to make well it's not incredible because we have over the last few years lionized ignorance uh, and and rewarded epic ignorance especially if it's got a jingoistic side order i don't understand anything about anything but i'll tell you what if it's a brit versus a greek then i'm siding with the brit and that was the kind of mindset that sunak was banking on so why has it backfired oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three and i mean genuinely is there any case whatsoever for arguing that the Elgin marbles should stay in the British Museum. I, I, I'd, I'd like to hear that. I want to hear the opposite argument as well. I want to hear you, <laughs> Laura in Renfrew points out, I need to be careful saying the phrase art sold on the radio. I take your point, Laura. I shall put my teeth back in and try again. Um, I, 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 I can't see at the moment. I, I did something about a year ago that I hardly ever do on the radio. And whenever I do it, I always feel slightly soiled by about 10 past the hour. And I thought that it is so obvious to me that these marbles belong in Athens that I'm going to come on air and argue the opposite. It's something you learn in debating societies at school. You you hone your skills by arguing the opposite. And I just thought it's such a no-brainer. I can't quite get my head around the absurdity of people arguing that Greek national treasures belong in the British Museum. So... What I'd like to do, what I tried to do that day was argue that, of course, they should stay in the British Museum. They were bought and sold legally, and we will look after them better. But I've been to the Acropolis Museum. It's purpose-built. There, there, are, there, are, there are holes in the museum waiting for the full marbles to arrive. And I can't, I'm afraid, keep up the, the, the pretense that this is even a two-sided argument. But there have been occasions in the past where I have thought there was no two-sided argument, and it turns out there was. So feel free to tell me why you think they should stay here. 
Feel free to tell me why it has backfired so badly for Rishi Sunak. Rob suggests it's because even the gammons are getting tired now. Is that true? I don't think it is, mate. Judging from Idiot's Corner, there there is no uh, limit to the amount of carefully cultivated fury that can be promoted in certain parts. Just look at the National Trust uh, arguments or look at the... um, There's a bloke who's been uh, suggested to present Have I Got News For You this weekend. Uh, Everyone using the word woke again. You can always excite fury among that constituency of people by pushing the right buttons. What's interesting to me about this story is that Rishi Sunak has failed to push the right buttons. It's almost as if, as well as being a rubbish politician, he's also a rubbish populist. Ooh, it's quite a good line. He's not just a rubbish politician, he's also a rubbish populist. 0345 973 is the number you need. If, question number one, tell me why this populist move by Rishi Sunak has failed so spectacularly, even annoying his own cabinet colleagues, let alone the Wokarati and the anti-growth coalition that, that we're all members of. And number two, draw on your knowledge of history and draw on your knowledge of, if you like, imperial legacy. Where does the idea come from that we have got the right to keep the Parthenon marbles, when by any logical perspective, they clearly should sit where they were sighted a couple of thousand years ago. I I just, I I genuinely, I, I know all the arguments about Lord Elgin saved them and the Turks were using them for target practice. But they belong to the British Museum. It's 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 not a it's not as if someone's going to have to mortgage their house in order to cover the cost of giving them back to the Greeks. It's just an act of diplomacy, an act of international decency. I, I love the idea that some people think we've got a right. To, is there anything behind the idea that we've got the right to keep absolutely priceless elements of Greek national heritage simply because we're British? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. Do you know what? I am equally interested in both of those questions. Why has Rishi Sunak's attempt at populism backfired so badly? 03456060973. And how, in all conscience, can anybody think that keeping beautiful and essential elements of Greek national heritage in a dark room in London is preferable or justifiable to putting them back where they were originally cited. 0345 6060 973. And the, the, other, the other argument I made when I was somewhat uh, facetiously claiming that the Brits should be able to keep all of the artworks, all of the treasures that we have collected from elsewhere in the world was that this is where they would be safest and then of course subsequently it's emerged that somebody had been nicking stuff from the British Museum and sticking it on eBay so I think that argument probably died a death at some point in the last six months as well so the question of how on earth we could have a right to keep them is an interesting one and I will take your answers to that although I, I have to be honest if your answer has been cold from the last time there was a phone in about the Parthenon marbles and it's going to involve something about Turkish soldiers using them for target practice and then being bought legally and therefore we should keep them, then um, then I'll need you to answer the question, well, what, what if I'd bought some artwork off, off a Nazi commandant who had uh, every legal right to sell it to me because they had at that time occupied the country in which the artwork was sitting and would my receipt showing that I'd paid uh, Oben Führer uh, whatever his name is, uh, 50 quid back in the day, would that be relevant to my claim that I should be able to keep it today? The point is that the, the, the marbles were not the Ottomans to sell in the same way that looted art in the Second World War was not the Nazis to sell. That's my contention. I, I you know, Not necessarily a hill I'm going to die on. Uh, you, you're welcome to pick holes in that argument, but it's important that you understand exactly what it is. The marbles were not the Ottomans to sell, so it doesn't really matter whether or not Lord Elgin has his receipts in place or not. Um, but the other element is why why Putin's got why Putin why Sunak's got this so wrong. Savas is in Stoke Newington. Kalimera, Savas. <laughs> Kalimera, um, I'm going to be speaking about the marbles. Oh, feet, mate, we're no. not going to be speaking at all until we've sorted that phone line out. My apologies. I'll come back to Savas, but I'll go first to Yanni, who's in Finchley. Yanni, what would you like to say? 
Uh, hi, first time caller. Welcome. Um, hi. Um, I think the marble should, should actually stay at the British Museum. And, and, and I'm Greek, by the way. Sure. Well, go on. You so need to uh, explain a little. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, um, I, I, I mean, I, I have thought about this quite a lot. Obviously, the ideal solution is for them to go back and be reunited with the museum. Um, but that is not going to happen, really. I, I, I don't think this is a realistic outcome. Um, the first time Greek government asked for the marbles was in 1835. And since then, there have been numerous requests and we are where we are today. Well, where, where, we are to, where we are today is that, that George Osborne, who is, I forget the specific job title of the British Museum, George Osborne has made quite a lot of noises about the possibility of entering into some sort of compromise agreement or some sort of sharing. So we're in a very, very different position in 2023 from the one we were in in 1835 or even when Melina Mercouri was uh, such a passionate advocate for the return of the marbles as well. So that is important to understand that, I think. No, no, I agree. I, I mean, I agree. They, and, you know, keeping our fingers crossed, there, there, there may be a way out of this. But in the case of an impasse, uh, I think what the British Museum offers is probably uh, one of the most um, important shopping windows, you know, in the global bazaar of culture, uh, being the most visited museum in the world. Um, he offers Greece an amazing opportunity to showcase his culture and display, you know, some of the most amazing artefacts. Uh, this is exactly uh, the argument I tried to make last year, but because you're making it from the perspective of being Greek, it obviously carries a lot more credibility than it did when I made it from the perspective of being a Brit, saying it's a much better place for it than than it would be in at the Acropolis. But I don't, I don't well, agree. I, I just think in terms well, of the... Let me, let me, the yeah, of let course, me, uh, of course, carry on. Um, I took my son there together with some of his friends. To the British uh, Yes, correct. Yes, some some time back, and you know, I didn't explain what they are, why they're here, and they were able to, you know, to marvel on the, you know, detail and the magnificent the magnificence of these um, um, items. Yeah. And you know, I I did that, and I'm sure many others have done the same, and um, that brings more interest in the culture, and I'm, and I'm sure more tourism. I, I, if you're going to do it in straight bums on seats, then we should stick it in the Louvre because that's more popular than the British Museum. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, you got me there, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or the Vatican Museums, or even Windsor Great Park, which gets considerably more uh, viewers every year. The Natural History Museum gets more visitors every okay. year. That, so you can't. I guess, I, I, don't... <laughs> point, I, guess, I guess my point is it is not, you know, uh, a, a bad situation for them to stay where they are. Uh, you know, it, it can be a workable situation. It, it can be a workable thing. And by the way, we're living in you know, in the age of the internet and they are and this is true. We are, and you know, we'll be able Greece, to make our own soon using a three D printer, and you won't well, be able to tell the that, difference. <laughs> Which is what they've Greece done in British? Athens. Actually, they've got they've got casts, haven't they? And I so the one, the the ones where there are gaps are the ones where the marbles are missing, and the ones where they're. Uh, the 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 London marbles, as it were, they've been, I think, cast and replaced yeah. with with kind of fakes. Yeah. So it is a little bit more nuanced than some of the debate allows. But you don't have any sense of what I would call patriotic. Well, I don't want to be seen unpatriotic about this. Uh, well, you yeah, are, you I are think... unpatriotic. Well, you, you, you know, and I know, you'd never, well, you'd never be able to achieve political office in Athens by saying that the marbles should stay <laughs> in London. Well, look, I, I, I look at it from purely the point of advertising the culture. And what is the best possible outcome in doing that? Yeah, and then do you it know. at the British Museum. I have you been Have you been to the Acropolis Museum? Have you? I have, yeah. I have yes. Because I, cause as a Brit, not as a Greek, but as a Hellenophile, I find it, I, I must have been a dozen times now, and I find it transporting. I find it absolutely extraordinary. And that might be colouring my point of view. I might be getting a bit dewy-eyed about it, but it just seems to me to be close to a no-brainer that they should be in the place that the sculptors envisioned them. Yes. No, no, I being. agree. That has to be clear. That is the ideal solution. But that, for me, okay. is more, more a, a utopia position. Yeah, oh, than, okay. Than, so you're uh, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. I, I respect that. Briefly, why do you think Sunak has called that Rishi Sunak has got this so wrong, Yanni? I think uh, it's down to his advisors, uh, James. Yeah. Yeah. I think some advisors said, uh, hang on a minute. 
this could know, be a good little I culture want. war. This could be a good little culture war yeah. thing, and it just isn't. Yeah. I think you're probably if you right. see if you see that Biden being fired soon, that will probably be them. <laughs> the one who said cancel the meet thank you mate uh, it's coming out to half past 11 the, the, the double question of, of I, I wonder if Yanni's closed it down it is clearly the fact that he's having absolute idiocy poured into his ear but Sunak's supposed to be the clever one the problem with culture wars is that they're not built on reality it's like racism you are lying to yourself if you are racist even if you think you've got legitimate concerns if you honestly hold a position based upon the belief that an accident of birth delivers some sort of innate or inherent superiority then even if you're an absolutely lovely bloke in every other aspect of your existence you're a liar you're lying to yourself and you're lying to everybody else so I, I mean, this could be this could be similar. Culture wars are largely bogus. They're an absolute load of nonsense. It's why 30p Lenoch and clowns like that like them because they just think that the louder they shout, the more powerful their position becomes. But actually, it's it's a little bit more complicated than just going, oh, look, there's a foreigner over there. Let's be rude to them and the base will love it. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.34. It's also Wednesday, of course. So PMQs will be upon us before you know it. And Natasha Clark will be joining me shortly to discuss what is likely to come up. Although neither of us have covered ourselves in glory in recent weeks. Last week, I'm not sure we could have got it more wrong. But hey-ho, it's all it's all, all the fun of the fair, eh? Um, and subsequent to that, we're going to have a look in the uh, final half hour of the programme at... The COVID-19 inquiry. Michael Gove yesterday was, I mean, I, I mean, it's a statement of the obvious, isn't it? It's like saying the sun came up. Michael Gove was just awful. Absolutely awful. I, I don't say this to boast because it's not actually something that I'm as proud of now as I was when it happened. But as, as a schoolboy debating champion, watching Michael Gove still using the same tricks and tactics that you use to win debates when you're 17, it's so dispiriting. I'm a big fan of debates, but not when you're giving evidence to an inquiry into why so many British people died unnecessarily or avoidably. And Gove did this really disingenuous, mealy mouth thing where he opens with an apology and, uh, and a catalogue of, of errors that could have been avoided. And then, he, and then he spends the rest of his evidence either obfuscating or waffling or talking out the question, ignoring the question, going off on mad tangents and completely... Uh, exon or seeking to exonerate all of his cronies and colleagues up to and including Boris Johnson and uh, Dominic Cummings. Boris Johnson, he, he told the inquiry, had adopted a gladiatorial approach to COVID. But by saying gladiatorial, he makes it sound honourable or admirable. Whereas what he actually adopted was a psychopathic approach to COVID. He thought it's a bit like when David Cameron said, oh, he'll be fine. I've seen him play tennis when Johnson caught COVID. It, it's just, I've told you a million times that, that the ruling class still lingering uh, or languishing under ideas that were, well, I suppose they were necessary if you needed to create an army of people that were going to go to the other side of the world and not only take over and start ruling and claim ownership, but also send back all the raw materials and treasures, uh, the, the, the soldiers of empire. But to see that mentality still in place in the 21st century, uh, when you look at the state of the country and wonder why so many of these problems have happened, it's impossible not to collect, not to connect the dots. And that leads us back to the Parthenon marbles, of course, which um, are another example of something that Imperial England felt that they had every right to buy, even if they were buying it from an occupying force in a, in a country whose history is absolutely inextricably entwined with the statuary on the Acropolis, uh, quite on the, at the Parthenon on the Acropolis to get, to get the uh, um, connections correct. 11.37 is the time. Anne is in Dendermonde in Belgium. Anne, what would you like to say? Um, as to the reason as why it didn't work, I think yes. it's because the people he's trying to appeal to, for them it's not confrontational enough. It's not good enough, so to speak, because mm. not they would probably agree with him that the Elgin marble in the UK, that's not the problem for them. But he didn't tell Johnny Fonner, because that's what they would have done, yes. to buzz off. And and he, it's almost seen as not macho enough, as not 
conversational loss. Also, they haven't got a personal investment in the marbles, perhaps. So with a National Trust property and some woke monster comes along and wants to put up a little notice explaining how much of the money that was used to build the house was actually raised in the slave trade, that's spoiling their cream teas, Anne. That's like, that's like putting some flies in their jam before they spread it on the scones and... And therefore, you can sort of muster it up as, as, a, as a culture war. But this, it's the British Museum. Most people that go there probably aren't British. The, the, the marbles obviously have been chipped down, literally torn down from the uh, Parthenon. And therefore, it doesn't quite reach the culture war parts that Sunak wanted it to reach. I think you're right. Miscalculation, yeah. though. I mean, quite an odd miscalculation, because the more we talked about it yesterday, the more obvious it was that this was going to backfire. Well, he's, of course, hugely incompetent. So well, there is that. that big yes. of a surprise. No, it's a very timely reminder. So I think that, that's pretty obvious in, uh, yeah. in the sense that it, it's not the first time he's done a miscalculation or don't, has an, an, an unfortunate uh, communication strategy these last few months. So you can, be bad, you can be bad at politics, like Nigel Farage, but good at, popul- yep. uh, but good at populism. Or you can be good at politics... Uh, like Gordon Brown and bad at populism. But if you're bad at politics and populism, you've got a bit of a problem in the current climate. Yeah, he's not good at any of the two, so. <laughs> uh, well, is there any argument to, to, to keep them in the UK? I don't think so, because if, even if you would, be, if, if, even if you went in for the story and said, OK, we did it to protect him, the circumstances against which they needed to be protected are no longer there. Oh, exactly right. Is there any? Are there any equivalents in Belgium? Are there? Are there any? Oh yeah, sort of, yeah. There's a lot of. Because of course, Belgium from, used to have uh, Congo as a. As well, I was a going to say from Leopold's time, there must have been yeah. loads of treasures shipped back for his vanity. Yeah, and, there's, and, there's, 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 there used to be. Um, there still is a museum in Tervuren for Africa, and um, it was quite paternalistic in its outset and, yes. and old, old style. And they did a whole remodeling, and quite a few of the exhibits have gone back to to, the, to Rwanda and uh, and and mainly the Congo, of course. And, and there, I mean, that is one argument. I don't know that it is a powerful argument. Thank you, Anne. The idea that if we give back the marbles, then we'll have to give back everything else that is in these museums. Uh, and and there, there may be some logic in that. Uh, it, it, it's almost pragmatic, pragmatism versus morality. I don't, I don't, um, don't see how the fact that we'd have to do lots of things that are obviously right means we shouldn't do one thing that is obviously right is necessarily quite as powerful an argument as some people making it clearly believe. But I, I, perfectly possible I'm missing something. 20 to 12 is the time. Kevin's in Glasgow. Kevin, what would you like to say? Oh, hi there. (laughs) Well, I think you just say that. You've just stolen my point. Uh, Oh, I didn't mean to. I'm just getting texted it a lot. So were you going to make the point (laughs) if we give this back, we'll have to give everything else back as well? Well, yeah, I, I was drawing yeah. an analogy to the fact that my, my dissertation in law school was on economics and the law, and, I, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but yes, you, you, you're going to open the floodgates, and yes, morally to do something right, and, and I, I think the, the marble should go back. Um, but but contract contract would be rent asunder. Mm. You, you, you'd have no you'd have, you'd have no reliance on the law. You'd have no reliance on contract. You'd have claims for, so it's more than so it's, it's, it's more than pragmatism it's actually it's it's so this is why and here's a word i've never said before this is why george osborne might actually be barking up the right tree when he seeks i think he sort of seeks a form of compromise or some form of sharing where they would be on display in athens but still owned by the british museum or something like that yeah they'd go back and then they go back and never come back and, and you know the, 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 the king would have to give back most of his property the, the you know the duke of marlborough you know, scotland would get its oil money back when we get independence you, you mm-hmm. know where does it end uh, it, it's it, it's just it's, it's impossible but i, I don't think most likely that's why well I think Sunak's probably picked the wrong narrative I think he's he's most likely had the advice in his ear uh, as one one of the strands of advice is we, we cannot do this because but I think you, you're absolutely correct he's he's latched on to this populist vote that he thinks he's going to win for he said yeah I don't yeah. well do you know what I think actually I don't think he believes in it and I think authenticity is crucial to that kind of dishonesty if that isn't a contradiction in terms <laughs> I think so. so the, you, you don't think about it too deeply, 
or you genuinely believe the nonsense that you're feeding to the red meat munchers, you can get away with it. But if you know it's nonsense and you can't quite tamp down the knowledge that it's nonsense, you end up doing what yeah. Sunak did on Sunday night. But the, 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 the bigger point is the, the danger he, he, that he's created for the UK, the, the, the danger by snubbing yes. a foreign leader in, in such a cavalier way is, is just so much more significant, so even right. the argument about the elder well, well, the message it's, it sends it's is incredible to, to other worlds. Yeah, yes, yeah. this is the point. So even if you want to argue that it's a dead cat from Sunak's point of view, that he wanted this to be on the newspapers on Monday rather than the COVID inquiry or the immigration figures or whatever it might be, the, the, the reason why the story has persisted for 48 hours in large part is because of the international dimension, not just the domestic disputes yeah. and the split in the cabinet. This is a NATO ally. Yeah, no, he's it, it, picked the wrong way of really making stupid. the point. Really yeah. stupid. Yeah. Um, I take your point, though, about perhaps the, dif- well, not even perhaps, the obvious legal uh, uh, difficulties with pursuing a, a straight return, giving it back. We give that. You could still say, I, I suppose, you could still say, well, we've given it back of our own volition um we haven't given it back because we were legally required to do or morally required to do we've just done it because these circumstances are unique and therefore it doesn't actually set any precedent for other treasures that other countries claim but it would be refer- referenceable that's a, that's a difficulty yeah, yeah I hear you. it just so, it just chips away at it yep. thus thus speaks the man the only man in this conversation with the legal training kevin thank you toby is in bristol which is in the news again actually because of the uh uh, slavery connotations and the and the historic legacy of some of the buildings there, but we're not talking specifically about that today. We're talking about the Parthenon marbles. What do you want to say, Toby? Um, I completely agree with the point you made um, earlier on, but the reason I found it was sort of a personal um, t- a- aspect on it, in that my family um, were bankers in Germany in 1939, and they also happened to be Jewish, Crikey. and they had a rather good art collection. Yes. And uh, wow. what happened was that to get out of Germany, they had to sell off the collection to the Nazis for a sort of a peppercorn amount. Yeah. And uh, I can go and look at them in New York now if I like. <laughs> Are you I serious? Have, uh, I am serious. Um, my family were called the Hirschlands, um, and they were a banking family, or a Jewish banking family. Um, who were very well respected in the city, and yeah, I won't go into too much depth. You, well, you can, can go online and find them. I will. I, I, well, you can go into as much de- de- depth as you want. How do I, how do you spell Hirschland? H i r s c h l a n d, and they were a family of bankers that settled in the 1800s um, in Essen, yeah. and were very philanthropic. Set up art galleries, um, but to get out, uh, one side of the family basically had to sell it all off. So and ha- ha- have family, there been attempts to get it back? There have over the years, but oh, to be honest, it's a pipe dream to believe that they would be. Um, there is no likelihood that we would. And to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't, as, as a member of that family, you wouldn't be able to look after them. So better that they're What are you talking about? You've got a sitting sure. room, haven't you, in Bristol? Oh, uh, yeah. We could put a Rembrandt. In the put a Rembrandt and above and the mantelpiece? That'll, that'll yeah, score you some points at Christmas drinks, but I well, I hear what you mean. If you've got Van Goghs and Rembrandts and the rest well, we of don't. it, I mean the point. The point is that we don't. I mean it's a his, it's historical fact, but it's not current. But I absolutely think that the marbles should go back to Greece. I think we have absolutely no right to keep them. And I think the point you made earlier on about twenty thirty minutes ago. Yes, there is no reason for us to keep them. I, can't I think see morally, that, really. except some yeah. sort of jingoistic I mean, sense of of, of 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 ownership, which is yes. Silly. And I think the reason Sunak is Sunak is just desperate. He's casting around for anything and everything. He's firing out comments and ideas. I mean, you know, the, the appointment of Cameron is just sort of yeah. case in point. He just there's just nothing he feels he can do. So it's like, well, I'll give this a try. Yes, fly this one up the flagpole, see what happens. And and, and on this occasion, everyone's sort of gone. Eh. Whatever. People quite like the Cameron appointment, although at least the people, some people did, but this one doesn't seem to have gone down with, with anybody at all, does it? It's a, no. it's, it's, it's a very strange one. I think we'll about the, dis- the, dis- the fact that he, he probably doesn't believe it himself is, is very apparent. Yeah. And, uh, his, and, and it's just being used. And I think the, the, the snub to the Greek Prime Minister is, is, is what it's about. What uh, the damage that it's done. Yeah, and indeed, as as the last call, thank you, Toby. Uh, I, I'm just reading about your family. Actually, it's a, an incredible story, incredible story, and, and an incredible collection, uh, which I suppose technically was was legally sold by your forebears to to the Nazis because the Nazis were in charge of what was legal and what wasn't legal, just as the Ottomans were 
in Athens at the um, at the turn of the 19th century. It is 11.47. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10 to 12, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I don't think, Darren, that your mate should feel too bad about this, albeit that you're clearly giving him a bit of a ribbing. We're just having a quick listen between jobs, James. Our crewmate and I are listening intently to the conversation about Marblegate. His response, why not just play for them? I looked at my colleague quizzically. He's a highly trained professional paramedic. And I said, what? He said, marbles. Just play like we did as kids. Winner, get, winner takes all. I'm stuck with him until midnight. A lot of people, myself included, um, were older than we should have been before we realised that the Elgin marbles, as they were called when we were growing up, were not actually marbles. I, I didn't, I mean, stop deeply to think about it but it was yeah i think when we were a sort of 10 or 11 years old you just presumed that they were ancient or prehistoric marbles that ancient greek people played with and therefore it was not remotely confusing when you were of an age where marbles were incredibly uh valuable modern artifacts it wasn't that hard to conceive of them being incredibly valuable ancient artifacts as well but it, but it is like uh, yeah i grant you it's probably not ideal if you're still clinging to that um, misapprehension now. Uh, PMQ's on the way with Natasha. After that, Paul Caruana Galizia is going to join us to talk to us about a remarkable new book he's written about his mother, Daphne, who um, you may already know, we've certainly met Paul before on the programme, was murdered uh, by people or via people unhappy with the journalism that she was doing. So an incredible project for Paul to have undertaken. And then at, uh, uh, just after 12.45, Fraser Knight will be with us to talk through what's happened today at the COVID-19 inquiry, which is doing that weird thing I feared it might do. It's throwing up a lot of really important and interesting information that isn't quite landing. I sense we may talk about this tomorrow. It's just not quite, do you know what I mean? It's like you've got two wheels turning, two cogged wheels turning. And the and the and the teeth of the cogs aren't quite biting. And and I I I don't know why whether it's because there's so much to process or whether it's because so much time has passed or whether because there is a subconscious desire to forget all about it and move on, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, I do, I do not know. Um, anyway, back to Sunak's miscalculation and the ultimate destination of the Parthenon marbles. I wonder if we called them the Parthenon marbles for the next 20 years, then the idea that they should be anywhere but the Parthenon would lose some of the saliency that it's still currently has. Uh, Costas is in Harrow. Costas, what would you like to say? First of all, I saw you a few weeks ago at Henry, so thank you again for all of you, for all that you do. Um, pa- Paracle Law, thank you for coming down. But oh, I remember you, I remember you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Did you come with your mum? Yes, yeah, yeah, I did. That, that <laughs> lovely. Now, you're going to disagree uh, with me on this one, then. So you're going to rip me a new one, particularly I'm not. because you mentioned the loop earlier. Go on. Uh, my, my concern about the debate is, is I think a distinction can be made between modern Greek state and ancient Greece, of course. I've got, you've got and, a very clicky line. I, I, I just want to check whether it's you or me, because I, if, it's, if it's you, it will be annoying everybody. But if it's me, then we can come back and, and do it differently. But there was, it was almost as if there was a sort of bit of water in the connection there, and it was it playing havoc with my, uh, my equilibrium. Um, quite a lot of people uh, are falling into the trap of Darren's work, mate, when it comes to the marbles. Are we going to give Costas another go, or are we going to crack on with... Um, with PMQs, we're trying to get him back up. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I, I, I mean, the, the idea quite a few... Well, hang on, I'll let Costas make the point. Carry on, I think this is better. Yeah, hey, James. Yeah, I think the distinction can be made between the modern Greek state and, and ancient Greece. And my concern about this debate is that I fear that it can lead to increased nationalist sentiment in Greece. Because yes. if, if you look at the Elgin marbles, I think it's not just Greek history. I think it's shared human history. Yes, It's about the shared human um, experience and the art that humankind has created. And I think that when you sort of equate it to a national identity, Gosh. you can increase, you can increase the risk of, you know, um, jingoism in Greece. And I think, I know you mentioned the Louvre earlier, mm. so this argument does fall apart. But I think when you look at the shared human experience... It doesn't it, fall apart. The numbers in the Louvre and the numbers in the British Museum are relatively negligible. I was just being a bit cheeky and pointing out... I that, see. <laughs> but, but, you know, if there was a museum in the world that got ten times more visitors than every other museum in the world, then your argument would... It could be reduced to, well, why don't we put everything in there then? Yeah, because I think if you look at all the people who visit the British Museum, I think it's a beautiful piece of art, which everyone can enjoy and share, and it's about... You know, if humanity comes together, this is the things that we can we can bring about. So, 
Yeah, that mm. was my that was my. No, I, I like that point, and and it's it's a, again as with the previous caller, it's a much better uh, articulation of what I tried to argue when I was somewhat dishonestly trying to defend the retention of them in the UK. Which brings us back to the authenticity question. Uh, you're being authentic in your argument. I wasn't being authentic in mine, even though I was making the same argument, which is mine. Why mine didn't land? It didn't sound right. Speaking of authenticity, how has Sunak got this so wrong then? He's got this wrong because he, 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 he some of your callers have your callers have made better points than than I can articulate. But he's just weak and he's trying to appeal desperately to yeah. the populist base. And um, why it isn't landing, I I, I can't. I think because he's not a natural talk, populist. Yeah, and I think people can see through that. I think with with Johnson and you know he he could naturally appeal to that crowd, but I don't think yeah. Sunak can land in the same way. Particularly because I think people can see right through him that he's a billionaire. Um, whereas Johnson came across as one of the lads, if you will, and Oof. I'd be in it. So, Maybe, yeah, no. <laughs> Final question. If What yeah. if the Magna Carta or Stonehenge were currently on display in Thessaloniki? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you laugh at my zinger? How dare you laugh at my brilliant question? Well, I guess, I, I, I guess, I guess, in that case, you could, you could say to, I think the argument in that case to bring them back to Britain makes more sense as you, the UK has small tourists. <laughs> but sorry, that was a really, really poor, poor response to that question. It's <laughs> a pretty ridiculous question, Costas. <laughs> Take care, my friend. I loved your mum as well. It's eleven fifty-seven. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It was, I wasn't expecting him to laugh that much. It was a kind of serious suggestion, but because he knows Thessaloniki well. He, he obviously realises that the, the amount of footfall you're going to be getting through any museum, even if it has Stonehenge and and the Magna Carta in it, is negligible compared to what you get at the British Museum. But I, that's the difference, isn't it, between the pragmatic arguments and the principled arguments. Pragmatically, you can see some sense in the idea that you put amazing artefacts in the place where the most humans will see them. You put amazing human artefacts in the place where most humans will We'll see them. But then you bring in the the nationalist or national angle. And how would you feel if Stonehenge and the Magna Carta were on display in Thessalonica? It, it, well, there you go. I'll leave that question hanging. Seriously. Uh, in fact, I stole that off Elsie. I have to give credit where it's due. She says, I disagree with this guy. Could you imagine if the Magna Carta was given to Greece? Um, well, it, uh, you know, uh, the, the, Tur the Turkish soldiers were using it for... No, the Norman soldiers were using it for target practice at the time. We had to get... Uh, it doesn't work. Natasha Clark is here, LBC's political editor. PMQs is on the way. I don't think we've got anything right in our predictions since you started in this job, Natasha. Are we going to change... That's an it's, absolute it's, lie. Is it an alternative fact, I think you'll prefer. <laughs> What's going to come up today? Well, I think if I were Keir Starmer today, I would go on the OECD uh, outlook report today, which shows that growth is going to stay awful for a long time to come. I think if I were him, that would be what I would go on. But it, to be honest with you, as, as per last week, Keir Starmer has a lot to go on. Does he go on the migration row? Does he go on the pathetic Elgin Marbles row? Um, there's How's a that lot of choice. playing among, among your Conservative contacts? Is there a bit of dismay at the way Sunak has handled this. Is there any comprehension of why he's done what he's done? I think there is. Uh, I think Tory MPs know that this is a bit of a dead cat strategy, don't they? They know right. that this is just to distract and get the headlines off the migration route while they try and work out what on earth they're going to do to try and allay those Tory MPs' fears about migration. And right now, they, they can see right through it. Uh, and Downing Street, I think, knew exactly what they were talking about on Monday when they cancelled that meeting at the last minute Such with the Greek contempt PM. Contemptuous treatment of the Greek It's just very pet, it's petty, isn't it? And it hasn't worked as a dead cat because now you've got front page stories about migration and page five stories about... about Snubbing the Greeks. Exactly. And I, yeah, I don't think it's gone down hugely well with Conservative MPs who, who you know, this is meant to be the serious government, isn't it? That's what, what Rishi Sinek keeps telling us. He's a, a serious prune. player. Uh, and on the issue of migration, how significant, as, as the I reports today, is Robert Jenrick's, I mean, vanishingly close to a abandonment of collective cabinet responsibility. I think Robert Jenrick is probably a little more hardline in his approach than James Cleverley, the Home Secretary, yes. is. Um, you know, maybe it's just being in the Home Office. Maybe it just makes you a little bit right wing. Who knows? Like Stockholm um, Syndrome. <laughs> exactly. How long until James Cleverly succumbs? Exactly. I don't know. But um, James Cleverly had a meeting with some of these Tory MPs last night to try and allay some of their fears. He said, look, guys, just back off a bit. Like, I'm trying. I'm trying. Give me a little bit of time. I've only been in the job for 14 days. But they, it sounded like they really had a go at him. Uh, this is <laughs> the, the, well, the, What I find really interesting about this, and, and we've touched on this actually in the last hour, is the dichotomy or the distinction 
between popu- politics and populism. So, cleverly, for all his faults, and we were reminded yesterday, he's a man who believes that a sausage can be patriotic, but cleverly <laughs> is trying to do politics, and yet the populism that has been practiced by his predecessors yes. and some of his colleagues is actually an obstacle to plausible politics. Yeah, and I think we should, to be honest with you, give James Cover a little bit of a chance. He has only been in there for 14 days. He is mm. seen as more of a sensible politician uh, and he's more amenable than, than you know, Suella Bravman in, in that terms. He's not going to be making these big promises about sending flights off to Rwanda if he can't keep them. Indeed. I think he knows personally that it's going to be a huge... Huge ask to even get that done. To have put so many eggs in that basket, even if it was pulled off uh, to its full effect, it's a few hundred people in the context of tens sure. upon tens upon tens of thousands. This is Wednesday afternoon, so at some point, Natasha and I will um, brutally curtail our conversation to cross live to the House of Commons when Sir Keir Starmer gets to his feet. Um, I, 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 yeah, he is almost spoilt for choice this week. If you if you had to bet the house on it, you'd go with the OECD, would you? On the Elgin Marbles, for sure. I think he's going to say, how crazy is this that we're talking about this? Why are we picking a fight with one of our allies? Why on earth are we Well, simply, why did you cancel the meeting? Because if he says, because he talked about the Elgin Marbles, he's going to sound a little bit pathetic, isn't he? Yeah, definitely. And also, just I think he might just stir the pot on migration a bit, really, Mm. and just say, look, your your entire party is divided over this, your whole cabinet is divided over this, you can't agree with you on this. Um, and, he, you know, he, yeah, that's, how, that's what I think he, he might do. But Rishi obviously has a couple of things he could mention. He could mention his NHS deal with the consultants, which the government think has been a little bit of a triumph. Um, yes. He obviously has got some tax cuts from last week he can look back to, which is obviously a good thing. Um, and he's having his investment summit this week as well. So I would bet some of those things will probably come up from his side. Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey's contribution to the national pageant yesterday. Would Starmer reference that? He could do, The yes. worst I've seen, this is the outlook for the UK economy, so it ties yeah. in with the OECD point. It's the worst I've seen in my lifetime. Pretty poor, isn't it? But yes, it's not ideal. It's not great for a man that you know was chancellor. So it's not like he can say, "Well, it wasn't my fault." It's the no. other guy. Oh, that's very true. Um, but yeah, I, in terms of in terms of the Rwanda policy, you know, Rishi Sunak has been essentially tied to it by Boris Johnson, hasn't he? It's not mm. even his policy, but but the economy, he can't shy away from that. That's that's all him. He was completely in charge. So. Yes, no, no getting away from that one, I think. So it's all to play for. And a question I don't normally ask you, and looking at the clock, you might be spared from answering it by Keir Starmer getting to his feet in the House of Commons. What do you think Stephen Flynn will go in on? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. It is, is, isn't it? I'm going to ask you that every week from now on, by the way. um, Will we rejoin the EU like Ursula von der Leyen seems to think we might? Mm. I know what the answer to that will be, at least in the (laughs) the current climate. Although I think it was John Curtis saying this week that Labour may have miscalculated when they believe that they can't campaign on a a realign with or a rejoin the European Union ticket. Do you think? Um, But no, it's not me. It's what I think John Curtis looked at the polling. I don't know if I agree. It is coming out to four minutes after 12. The situation in the House of Commons remains febrile. We will, as I mentioned, be crossing live to the uh, to Parliament as soon as Sir Keir Starmer gets to his feet. I'm not in my usual studio, so I'm actually, I think it's of interest to precisely nobody. I'm having to crane my head to, to see the relevant screen, but as soon as someone barks in my ear, we will... Uh, I'm we keeping will, your seat very warm for you, James. Uh, thank you very much. We will, we will cross live um, to there. Anything else that we might sort of fill a bit of space with before we start hearing what actually happens at PMQs? I wonder if we'll talk any more about the ceasefire because obviously it's oh. great news that it's been extended um, and I, I would personally think that some MPs would like to see a little bit more detail on what, how many hostages we've got out, how many Brits are still left in there uh, and sort of the next steps for this. And we've got David Cameron in Ukraine as well um, meeting with the Greek foreign minister. So <laughs> I wonder if we will see any awkward moments come out of that too. Those are two things I would also keep my eye it, on. It, is there any clear blue water between Starmer and Sunak on the uh, ceasefire question? I think, to be honest with you, there, there has been, and obviously Sunak, uh, uh, sorry, Starmer rather, has faced such big pressure from his own backbenchers on mm. the ceasefire. Um, but I don't. I think the moment of maximum danger for Sakir Starmer has probably passed. With the with the with the pause, actually, with the thing he exactly. was calling for actually happening, which is the best, I suppose, at risk of sounding brutal in such in such bloody circumstances, the best you can hope for is for the thing that you're calling for to happen. Yeah, well, both of them have said they will support uh, a ceasefire in, in essence. OK, pause, we're going now. Here is Sir Keir Starmer, as promised, on his feet. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In an effort to hide from his failures, the Prime Minister spent this week 
arguing about an ancient relic that only a tiny minority of the British public have any interest in. Mr Speaker, that's enough about the Tory party. In 2019, they all promised the country that they would control immigration. Numbers will come down. The British people will be in control. How's it going? How's it going? Ah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear. The levels of migration are far the levels of migration are far too high, and I'm determined to bring them back down to sustainable levels. That's why we've asked the Migration Advisory Council to review certain elements of the system. We're reviewing those findings and we'll bring forward next steps. But earlier this year, we announced the toughest action ever taken to reduce legal migration. The effects of that action are yet to be felt that will impact 150,000 student dependents and forecasts show that migration is likely to drop as a result. But all we've heard up until this moment from the Honourable Gentleman on this topic is a secret backroom deal with the EU that would see an additional 100,000 migrants here every year. Mr Speaker, never mind the British Museum, it's the Prime Minister who's obviously lost his marbles. Mr Speaker, the Greek Prime Minister, the Greek Prime Minister came to London to meet him, a fellow NATO member, an economic ally, one of our most important partners in tackling illegal immigration. But instead of using that meeting to discuss those serious issues, he tried to humiliate him and cancelled at the last minute. Why such small politics, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, of course, of course, we're always happy to discuss important topics of substance with our allies, like tackling illegal migration or indeed strengthening our security. But when it was clear that the purpose of a meeting was not to discuss substantive issues for the future, but rather to grandstand and relitigate issues of the past, it was inappropriate. But furthermore, 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 when specific commitments and specific assurances on that topic were made to this country and then were broken, it may seem alien to him, but my view is when people make commitments, they should keep them. Mr Speaker, I discussed with the Greek Prime Minister the economy, security, immigration. I also told him we wouldn't change the law regarding the marbles. It's not that difficult, Prime Minister. The reality is simple. He has no plan on boat crossings and migration is at a record high. A record high. His policy is that companies can pay workers from abroad 20% less than British workers. That has contributed to those record high immigration levels, hasn't it? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, he talks about the boat crossings. He's failed to notice illegal boat crossings are down by a third this year, Mr Speaker, thanks to every one of the actions that we've taken that he opposed every single time they were raised. But look, Mr Speaker, no one will be surprised that he's backing an EU country over Britain. Just this last week he was asked... Just this last week, just this last week, he was asked which song best sums up the Labour Party. What did he come up with? Well, Mr Speaker, he showed his true colours and chose Ode to Joy, literally the anthem of the European Union. And he will back back Brussels over Britain every single time. Let me get get this straight. The Prime Minister is now saying that meeting the Prime Minister of Greece is somehow supporting the EU instead of discussing serious issues. He's just got dug further into that hole that he's made for himself. And ever, rather than deal with the facts, he's prosecuting his one-man war on reality. And that, that reality is stuck. Under this government, a bricklayer from overseas can be paid £2,500 less than somebody who's already here. A plasterer, £3,000 less. An engineer, £6,000 less. The list goes on. It's absurd. Labour would scrap his perverse wage-cutting policy. Why won't he? 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, as I said, we have taken significant measures and will bring forward more. And indeed, as the ONS themselves said, more recent estimates indicate a slowing of immigration as a result of the things that we're doing. But I am surprised, Mr. Speaker, to hear him now taking this new position, because I've got a quote here from a pushy young shadow immigration minister who said, and I directly quote this person, he told this House that limits on skilled migrants are, and I quote, a form of economic vandalism. Who could possibly have taken such a bizarre position to only then U-turn? It will come as no surprise to anybody that it was him! Mr Speaker, there's only one party, one party that's lost control of the borders and they're sitting right there. And this is a government not just in turmoil, in open revolt. The Immigration Minister thinks the Prime Minister is failing because apparently nobody will listen to his secret plan. (laughs) The former Home Secretary thinks he's failing because of his magical thinking. The current Home Secretary thinks he's failing. He even took time out of his busy schedule insulting people in the North East to admit he agrees with Labour. The Prime Minister seems to be the only person on the Tory benches without his own personal immigration plan. (laughs) Clearly, his own side don't have any faith in him. Why should the public? Mr Speaker, it's... It's really a bit rich to hear about this from someone who described all immigration law as racist, who literally said it was a mistake to control immigration. We have taken steps and we will take further steps, which is why recent estimates of immigration show that it's slowing. It's why next year the immigration health surcharge will increase by over two-thirds. It's why immigration fees are going up by up to 35 per cent. But, Mr Speaker, when one of his own members of his front bench said that having a target isn't sensible, Right? It's no surprise, Mr Speaker, to have people like this, because this is the person, Mr Speaker, while we're taking all these measures that he opposed, this is the person who stood on a platform and promised to defend free movement. On their watch, migration has just trebled and is giving the House a lecture about targets. He's lost in La La Land. There can be few experiences more haunting for the members opposite than hearing this Prime Minister claim that he's going to sort out a problem. First, he said he'd get the NHS waiting list down. Uh, They went up. Unabashed by that, he said he'd get control of immigration. It's gone up. Following that experience, he turned his hand to bringing taxes down. And, would you believe it, the tax burden is now going to be higher than ever. It is ironic that he's suddenly taken such a keen interest in Greek culture (laughs) when he's clearly become the man with the reverse Midas touch. (laughs) Everything he touches turns to... uh, Maybe the Home Secretary could help me out here. Uh, Rubbish. So will the Prime Minister do the country a favour? We'll have to check the tape again, uh, Mr Speaker, I think. So will the Prime Minister do the country a favour, warn us what he's planning next, so we can prepare ourselves for the disaster that will inevitably follow? Mr Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of the year, we said... Mr Speaker... Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, at the beginning of the year, we said we would halve inflation, and this government has delivered. Easing the burden on the cost of living for families everywhere. But we know his plans, Mr Speaker. All the way through that, what did he do? Back inflationary pay rises. He talked about welfare, no controls for welfare, and borrowing £28 billion a year that would just make the situation worse. He mentioned tax, Mr Speaker. Just this past week, we've delivered the biggest tax cuts since the 1980s for millions of people and businesses, increased pensions and benefits, and this week secured £30 billion of new investment for this country. So he can keep trying, Mr Speaker, to talk... Oh, oh, pl- Britain isn't listening. Can I just say to the Shadow Foreign Secretary... Oh, order! Just a little bit quieter, please. I want to hear. Right. Remember, Chiste. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The government has rightly responded to the shocking and unacceptable rise in anti-Semitism. 
and we saw extra funding in the autumn statement. I note that 44% of religiously aggravated motivated offences last year were against the Muslim community. Yet there was no funding in the autumn statement to deal with Islamophobia. The government's independent advisor role for Islamophobia has been left vacant for over one year. The Prime Minister knows we discussed these matters over a year ago, yet no action has taken place. Prime Minister, enough is enough with regards to tackling anti-Muslim hatred. Will the government now finally take action? Mr Speaker, we won't tolerate anti-Muslim hatred in any form and expect it to be dealt with wherever it occurs. I actually recently met Tal Mama, a service that provides support to victims of anti-Muslim hatred, who we have in fact supported with over £6 million of funding since its inception, and we are in regular dialogue with them. We have also, Mr Speaker, doubled the funding for protective security measures through the Protective Security for Mosque scheme, and will continue to do everything that we can to keep our Muslim community safe. P leader Stephen Flynn. Um, Mr Speaker, in good news for kids this morning, it was snowing in Aberdeen, and when they looked out of the kitchen window, they would have been filled with delight. But for the parents, many of them who looked out the kitchen window this morning would have been filled with dread. Dread knowing that they simply can't afford to pay their energy bills. So in that context, can I ask the Prime Minister, does he regret offering no financial mechanism whatsoever towards families this winter? Minister. Mr Speaker, that's simply not right to say that there isn't support for families this winter. There's been considerable support this year for energy bills, and this winter pensioner households, this winter pensioner households, for example, will receive up to £300 alongside their winter fuel payment because they're some of the most vulnerable households, and it's right that they get that support at a difficult time. Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, I appreciate it's difficult for the Prime Minister to empathise when he quite clearly can't understand. But to be clear to both him and indeed the whole House, this isn't a matter of energy production. Scotland produces six times more gas than we consume and around two thirds of our electricity already comes from renewable resources. This is a consequence of decades of failed energy policy here in Westminster. Now, those of us on these benches, we believe that Scotland's energy wealth and our energy resource should benefit the people of Scotland. Why doesn't he? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the entire energy grid infrastructure in this country is integrated, which brings benefits to people in every part of our United Kingdom. But when it comes to supporting people with energy bills, Mr. Speaker, that's why earlier this year we increased benefits at the highest rate uh, on record. It's why we've provided cost of living payments worth £900 on top of regular support. And it was right, Mr. Speaker, not to wait till the last moment to give people that support. We gave it to them earlier this year so they would have the security they need going into winter and as I said on top of the money for pensioners and when there are cold snaps we have cold weather payments that kick in and the warm homes discount providing an extra £150 to the most vulnerable households. All of that is the most considerable action taken by any government to help people with their energy bills. The £400 million redevelopment of Kettering General Hospital is the number one investment priority for local residents. The first part of this is a 50 million minutes after 12. We, I feel that they have delighted us for long enough. We shall pick over the bones of what are what has just unfolded at PMQs with Natasha Clark after this. James O'Brien on LBC. 22 minutes after 12 is the time. I keep forgetting to tell you that we're, we're actually I shouldn't tell you. I'll tell you tomorrow. There you go. That, that'll build up some tension. I was about to tell you that we're live on YouTube now with the show, but I've just realised that today's one of the days when we're not. So just pretend that last 30 seconds of the programme never happened. All right. Are we cool, everybody? Thank you. Uh, Natasha Clark is here, LBC's political editor. Shall I give you a flavour of what the punters thought about that, Natasha? Please. A few aces served up by Keir Starmer today. I think Rishi tried but failed to take the ball home, says Paul in Glasgow. Ian in Brentford, God's own country. So Starmer's best PMQs by a country mile. He was on fire. Daniel in Liverpool. Can't remember Starmer having a better PMQs than that. Rishi rinsed. Starmer was on fire, James. That was a bloodbath, says Chit. And man, writes Tommy, KS actually had me laughing whilst making sense. I can't help but think that he ripped the PM pretty well. I could go on. I completely agree with all of those. 
Mm. I think that was Keir Starmer's best ever PMQs. Best genuinely. ever? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. No, I thought it was really good. And Why? Like, Why? Keir, because Why? Keir Starmer's not usually that funny and he managed no. to pull it off and he managed to make a joke and everybody actually laugh, like quite, quite a few of them. Mm. Um, but also the fact that the uh, Labour Party decided to use all of their six questions on immigration, like how telling is that? Like, well, it the, means they're attacking the Tory party from the yeah, right. On the, one way but on their, their ground. And, you know, it just seems like the next election, uh, Keir Starmer is just parking his his tanks on, on the Tory lawn, isn't it? Going on economy, going on immigration. You know, it's it's pretty good for him, I think, to, to be able to have such an impact on some uh, ground, which I think, you know, is traditionally seen as the Tories ground. So, yeah, some of those quips I think he made were really good. Um, you know, this is the party that's lost control of the borders. Like mm. the idea that the Keir Starmer is, is saying this and it's actually sticking is is good. And, you know, he's got a good story to say here. The fact that Labour's policy was t- is to scrap that rule, which means that they can be paid, that uh, immigrant workers can be paid 20 percent less. Um, you know, that sounds like something the government and the Migration Advisory Committee will actually do. And I think it's probably good for them to to get on the offensive on that mm. policy. I think it looks quite good. You had that amazing joke just at the end there about the Home Secretary. Um, yes, obviously that making, was very good. That make, was very good. And you're right, because normally even when it's a well-scripted joke, he's not he's the most not natural the most, deliverer. No, I completely agree with that. But I genuinely think that was one of his best ever performances. You know, he was lost in La La Land, waiting lists up, immigration up, taxes up. You know, makes a very Is strong it, point. It was very good. I, I, I can't remember who it was that talked about lucky generals, or it might have been Napoleon. But the 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 on on immigration, he is he's looking at, almost as if he's stolen Rishi Sunak's lunch in a sense, because those five pledges, when they were made, were made with a degree of confidence that gravity would deliver them, uh, that just natural attrition or the natural unfolding of events would deliver things that Rishi Sunak could then claim that he'd presided over. If Starmer does win the next election, then, uh, you know, another Ukraine or Hong Kong notwithstanding, there are going to be significant reductions in our net immigration figures. And the people who consider that to be an unalloyed good thing are going to think that it had something to do with Keir Starmer. Is there any political risk of alienating the people who don't buy in to the very, very common now narrative the very prevalent narrative that immigration is somehow in and of itself a bad thing yeah for sure i mean that's so many of labor supporters believe well, exactly. that pro, you know a pro they should be pushing a pro immigration stance but but they have the people in the labor party for sure have lost that argument um the direction that the party is has taken is that you know they you know want to try and hang on to arguably that red wall vote who think that immigration is too high and that we need to be looking at doing something about it. Um, well, it would be extraordinary if in a couple of years we're attacked, well, not you because you're not allowed an opinion, but I am attacking Keir Starmer for having hobbled the economy by having too hard a line on immigration. Gosh, we're playing hypothetical. Well, it's, well, it's, there, well but... we're not really because he is going to adopt a very hard line on immigration and most of the expert analysis would say, um, including actually the Migratory uh, uh, Migration Advisory Council, they would say that that will have. They're already warning about it having a detrimental impact on the economy if they do abolish that 20% window. So it would be odd for a Labour Prime Minister to be in the position of coming under attack for hobbling the economy upon the altar of cutting migration. Yeah, which is exactly the, the dilemma that Rishi Sunak faces at the mm-hmm. moment because all of his MPs are saying, well, actually, the numbers are too high. What are we going to do about it? And was, obviously, there's a big row going on in government uh, about how far to go because you know imagine if we had not seen this big immigration number that we saw last yeah. year nearly three quarters of a million um, obviously we've seen the economy just about scraping on the floor imagine if we hadn't had those numbers would we be in a recession right now like everybody predicted that we would be yeah. about six months ago but no one's making that argument are they no not presume the lib dems are are they uh, to pass. I uh, can't say I've listened much to the Lib Dems oh, recently. I'm so that's sorry. Not fair. I know it is. Yeah, I know. I, saw um, it. I, and I love the line. I met with the Greek PM. We talked about the economy, security, immigration. I also told him we won't be changing the law regarding the marbles. It's really not that difficult. I, I, I mean, Sunak has made himself look ridiculous, as we discussed before PMQs on that. But Starmer just really drove the point home there, didn't he? He did. And he was able to make the point of, well, at least I had the balls to meet with the guy and you mm. didn't. And, you know, that makes him look like the statesman. And, you know, it, it really plays into what Labour are trying to do of just showing the alternative. And here's Keir Starmer. Here's this prime minister in waiting. I will pr- be prepared to meet with anybody. I'm not going to throw a hissy fit, not going to throw my toys out the pram. We can have difficult discussions. And, and that worked out really well for Labour today. I definitely agree.
Uh, and, and a little bit of desperation from Sunak, although, you know, some of it was evidence-based. The the line about there being a racist undercurrent to all immigration laws, which he um, stated that Keir Starmer had once said. Do you know, Natasha Clark, how old Rishi Sunak was when Keir Starmer said that? When did Keir Starmer say that? Was it when he was DPP? I'm not, I'm not, so I'm not telling guess. you. That would give you away. How old do you think Rishi Sunak was? when? I get, well, no, he wasn't DPP at the time. How old do you think Rishi Sunak was when Keir Starmer said that there was You're a You're going to say it's like five or He was eight. He was eight. eight. He was eight. It's only the go. second time lucky. Nearly. <laughs> Isn't that absolutely extraordinary? Yeah, that was... Um, obviously, Rishi Sunak didn't press the emergency Jeremy Corbyn button that we see him do you think press that, so many times. Do you think times. that is deliberate? Because uh, quite a few people were predicting wow. that he was about to because it was going so so badly maybe they've realized it actually now has, has segued from being effective to being in effect or being the opposite of effective being a net negative no because he pressed the uh, the eu button instead didn't yes, he? he said did. oh, <laughs> oh i can't use jeremy corbyn in this one but i'll use the eu button saying you know keir starmer's down with favorite. beethoven down exactly. with beethoven My, is quite a flex i thought that was actually a very funny reference uh to be honest i think that was probably the only self saving grace that rishi had which was a, a slightly funny moment where he pointed to that classic fm uh, well, interview where I, he said that was look keir starmer like should have known a good ex- team playing there mentioning have, our sister station exactly, classic fm but i think you he will should have find known exactly what he was doing when, oh, when he said that he should have done I think you'll find that Beethoven was composing the Ode to Joy long before the European completely Union completely agree existed. but the European Union did adopt it as their national anthem when was it the 70s or the 80s it's Can a you... thing of beauty of course it is but you know Keir Starmer should know that, that by t- saying that yeah, that is his right, favourite or the Labour it, it it leaves open up the a little party, gap a tiny little gap for Rishi Sunak to make a completely facetious but yep. nonetheless no doubt effective with elements of the base point yes. uh, Natasha Clark many thanks is that what you're giving yourself marks out of 10 for your prediction you know then? what I've marked myself well, yeah. I did say tax cuts oh, yeah, did say OECD investment. was where you went okay, uh, yeah, fair yeah. enough I, I, I did say I migration ac- I didn't hear that acronym did no, I at all no, no. Well, I did say Elgin Marbles and I did say migration no you did indeed so, Very good. so I what's think your mark I, I seven, okay. six yeah I'd say six, six and a half six and a half please six and a half out of ten it's a new record half past twelve is the time Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines James O'Brien on LBC 12.35 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where you may have noticed I've been so busy furiously plugging my own book that I have neglected my regular attempts to influence your reading and and, and make recommendations about things you should be looking at I'm going to turn your attention next to a story that you may be familiar with a tragedy indeed that you may be familiar with Uh, I, I refer to the story of, of Daphne Caruana Galizia, a Maltese journalist who, uh, well, essentially essentially lifted the lid upon uh, a mafioso-style cooperation between gangsters and government in her home, Malta, that led to some of those gangsters uh, killing her in 2017. Shortly after, actually, she, she wrote specifically about the Maltese government do your worst, you bar stewards, although that's not the word she used, until the only option left to you is to take out a contract on my life. And while some of the details remain to be completely clarified, it, it, it appears that that is precisely what happened. Um, her son Paul, Paul Caruana Galizia, has taken upon himself to tell an incredible story of his mother and chiefly of his mother's life and work in this field, in in, in combating corruption and inevitably also of of her death, a a death in Malta by Paul Caruana Galizia is out now. And and Paul joins me now. You'll know him already, of course, if you're a regular listener to this programme for his work at Tortoise, his hosting of the London uh, Grad podcast and, and, and a couple of appearances with us in the past, but never in circumstances quite as poignant or as powerful as this. I'll start, Paul, if I may, with, with the obvious question. Why did you feel this book needed to be written? Well, thank you, James, first of all, for having me. I wanted to write the book because for the past six years, my brothers and I have been in and out of court and, um, you know, in criminal proceedings, a public inquiry. And we felt that our mother was getting lost in in that mess of mm. proceedings and evidence, and that the sense of her as a journalist, as a mother, was being lost, and, and what she wrote about, what she stood for. So the book was 
primarily an attempt to restore that fullness of her life, but also to tell the story of her assassination because it hadn't been done coherently in a single narrative until this book. And of course, the the work, the incredibly courageous work, and that that quote that I just shared a moment ago shows that she knew exactly how high the stakes were. The work that she did that led to that 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 assassination. It is extraordinary journalism. It is, and I so I'll pl- I'll plug your book for you a little bit. <laughs> so you you start with that boiled frog analogy and how these. You know, a country can fall apart in a really strange way, almost imperceptibly. And and that was happening in Malta. And my mother went, you know, without realizing it until until really it was too late mm. that she went from reporting on sort of minor low level corruption to reporting on on really huge corruption schemes as Malta globalized. And that She wasn't just reporting on this small European country, but on um, a member of the European Union that had globalized its economy and turned itself into this conduit, you know, a a state that provided access to the rest of the European Union. And she was just doing it alone. And it was only maybe in the last year, two years of her life, that the, the risks and dangers became very apparent. Uh, culminating, I, I, I suppose, in the, the ultimate vindication when judges, Maltese judges, finally conducted mm. the inquiry you, you refer to, concluding that the country had been moving towards a situation which could be qualified as a mafia state. It was the, the, the journalist, your mum's assassination, that put a break on this predicted disaster. I'm going to ask this question very delicately. Mm. But if your mum hadn't died, would those conclusions ever have been reached? I think I think the judges are right that it was really my mother's assassination that marked the point at which people in Malta started reflecting on the state of the country. Mm. And it took something like that. So it took a, a car bombing of the country's most famous journalist, you know, in broad daylight. It was Monday, 3 p.m., right outside our house to get people to begin asking questions. And it took many years, right, until that public inquiry's conclusion. Yes. But um, if it weren't for for the murder, then we wouldn't have had the growth in civil society that Malta experienced after the murder, the campaign for a public inquiry. Um, that has slowly started changing the country and, and turning this... A real like tide of corruption is finally turning. Um, so, if it, if it weren't for that, you know, as the judges said, Malta would still be an entrenched mafia state. I, I, I mean, you describe an extraordinary legacy, and it's the proper recognition of that legacy, I think, that has driven you in part to to tell this story. Yes, exactly. And I mean, for me, it's a very personal legacy, right? I wasn't a journalist before my mother was killed. Um, And I became one, you know, at the time because I couldn't really imagine doing anything else when I had to return to work. And the kind of reporting I do is a reflection of the kind of work she did. But um, the, um, the kind of campaigning my brothers and I had to do it's something we were thrown straight into, right? She was, she was reporting on really serious political corruption, mm. and you know the authorities that were meant to investigate her murder were the were the same ones she was reporting on, and so that kind of threw us into a war with the government. Um, and and then you know as as the campaign progressed and as I turned to work. I just became very interested in how corruption spreads and and takes hold of a society and how it eats away at institutions. And um, I'll plug your book again and (laughs) how we how we can ultimately break a country um, without you realizing it until it's too late. Slowly, slowly. Um, Mm -hmm. What what about Paul the son rather than Paul the journalist? There must be moments. There must have been moments both while she was alive and after you lost her, where you thought, why does it have to be my mum that does this? Oh, (laughs) 
there were so many moments. <laughs> there were moments like that growing up. There were moments like that, you know, when I was a teenager and I thought life would be easier if she weren't a journalist. Yeah. But I, I don't know. We kind of grew up around it. And at the same time, it was unimaginable to us that she she wouldn't do the kind of reporting that she did. It yeah. was so much a part of her. She was so obviously made to do it. She could not do it. She could not do it, right? And in the book, I, I quote from this interview she gave 10 days before her murder. And yeah. the, an interviewer asked her, why? Why do you do this? And she said, I love it. It's a compulsion to write. And and really nothing could have stopped her except except the car bombing. To, to let the light in. Did you find out anything about her that you didn't know already? Uh, a lot actually <laughs> the the funny thing about the book was this that i i thought the murder would be the really hard thing to cover but in the end i just did it as a reporter you know yes. a lot of evidence had been heard in open court and there are people you can interview and and so on but then when i sat down to write about her life before journalism before us and and her marrying my father I realized I knew nothing at all and so had to sort of look up her, you know, her first love and her old school friends and what made her a journalist. And I I found that very moving, actually, and how she was shaped by the Malta she grew up in and the things she saw. And that was all new to me. And and it made sense of, of why she was so determined, you know, she grew up in a very corrupt Malta, a very closed Malta, and she was someone who always loved reading, and that love of reading gave way to one of writing, and she always saw writing as a way or a means of, of forcing change, and and that kind of trajectory was very interesting to me, it's not something I ever realised before I sat down to write. And, and you found those sort of early building blocks that would later be assembled into the remarkable woman and remarkable journalist that your mum became yes that's right so the you know she had a job very early on that involved dealing with a government licensing office and she noticed people were paying and taking bribes there and she just refused to let them you know in a in a summary way of describing them let them take over her country and um it was it was through writing that she wanted to change it and and in the end she did you know it's it's a story with a horrible ending i hope it's not the ending but yes. a horrible murder um but it also shows the power of journalism to change an entire country hmm. and and everyone's lives in it. it it's a it's a horribly abused and misused word paul but but it's it's an act of it's it's the ultimate act of patriotism what your mum did in a way yes i i think so and i am um, at the end of the day she is someone who loved her country yes. and the people who killed her the people who said they're proud of being maltese and hmm. that my mother was you know destroying the country's reputation through her writing at the end of the day, they're the ones who didn't love their country. They're the ones who stole from it, who destroyed our institutions, who killed one of its citizens. Um, they are the ones who actually, the facts say, hated their country and saw nothing in it other than personal gain. A Death in Malta by Paul Caruana Galizia is out now. I'll just share with you the, the, the words of the doyen of, of BBC foreign correspondence because um, John Simpson knows what he's talking about and he has described the book as unforgettable, beautifully written and deeply honest. I, it also, if you'd allow me, Paul, to say if there was any danger whatsoever of your mum's assassination being the end of her story, then I think this book ensures that it never will be. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. Paul Caruana Galizia, the, the author, as I say, um, of, a, of a memoir of his mother's life, work and death, a death in Malta. The time now is 12.47. James O'Brien on LBC. 
Uh, an extraordinary book, extraordinary young journalist as well. It's only five years ago that, that he lost his mum. And and she, Daphne didn't start off as a, as a journalist. It was almost as if um, it was thrust upon her. She felt this responsibility to report reality. And, and Paul, in the most grim and tragic of circumstances, has, has inherited that. I really do urge you to, to, to have a... Well, to buy that book or to get it out of the library, have a read of uh, Death in Malta, an extraordinary book. Um, we turn our attention next to today's events at the COVID-19 inquiry, possibly a little taste of yesterday's as well, because, of course, it continues long after I come off air. Jenny Harries and Sajid Javid, the new contributors, uh, Fraser Knight, LBC's reporter, has been keeping a very, very close eye on proceedings. Fraser, well, 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 where do we start? I think let's just start uh, again with Michael Gove yesterday, James. After we spoke, uh, it did go on for you know another few hours, and there was actually a bit of an argument between Michael Gove and the inquiry lawyer that ended up happening, uh, and it was over the sort of questions that were being asked. Michael Gove actually described them as being curious, with the inquiry lawyer seemingly trying to stop him from making some political points. Now that specific example was actually around uh, the support that was given to devolved governments. He was talking about the Barnet formula and the fact that you know, money was given to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to deal with this. Uh, Michael Gove said he admired Nicola Sturgeon, I found quite interesting, uh, in how she dealt with the pandemic, but still was making a bit of a political point about, you know, the fact that Scotland had different rules and then were asking for more money, comparing that to the likes of Andy Burnham, where the rules were being almost imposed on them and then they were asking for more money. And there was also a a bit of contention tension around uh, the suggestion Michael Gove had made about needing to be aware of where the virus had come from. A a contentious issue, of course. Uh, Here's what you have to say about that. There is a significant body of uh, of judgment uh, that believes that the the virus itself was man-made. And that, that presents... Well, we're a set of challenges as well. Forms no part of the terms of reference of this inquiry, Mr. Gove, to address that somewhat divisive issue. Now, of course, James, the inquiry's remit is to look at the preparations and the response to the pandemic, and so they won't be looking at where the virus might have come from. But Michael Gove uh, making clear there and in his written evidence that it was certainly looked at seriously as to whether this virus may have been man-made and has actually had uh, some support from other MPs talking uh, about the fact that he brought that up, uh, saying that we can't shy away from that if we need to look seriously at potential future pandemics. Uh, Now, Jenny Harris, uh, the former Deputy Chief Medical Officer, of course, now head of the UK Health Security Agency, she was giving evidence after him and continued into this morning. And quite interesting, actually, a slightly different tone to some of the other scientists that we heard from last week. She said that she had been warning against locking down too early when it came to this pandemic. She said it was important that we didn't miss that key period where, you know, yet to wait until the peak of the virus was coming to then suppress it. And she also said that she uh, supported, in some respects, putting uh, infected people who were in hospital into care homes. She said it was almost inevitable. It would have had to have happened and they just had to be careful about how they did that. Uh, of course, uh, she knew it would be unpopular among families, but said as cases began to rise in the community, then it would have been easier to do. She did also raise concerns about the effectiveness of homemade face coverings. And she had that recommendation put in front of her uh, to say, can you sign off on this? And she said that there was a lack of evidence to say whether that would have worked or not uh, and if it would have just given people a false sense of security. I mean, maybe I was a little bit annoyed. (laughs) I can see it in the the tone there, but um, where... There wasn't a clear policy, and yet I was being sent a document to sign off something which I didn't think was very evidence-based. But um, that was not an infrequent occurrence. 
Sajid Javid uh, has begun giving evidence in the past sort of hour or so, of course, the former health secretary and former chancellor. And again, we've been talking about the functionality of government. He actually said that the extent of dysfunctionality in number 10 is at a scale that he had never seen before. Very similar to what we heard from Michael Gove yesterday, actually talking about, you know, the role of the cabinet office in all of this. But Sajid Javid, again, bringing up his... Uh, displease his big, you know, arguments that he's had with Dominic Cummings in the past, saying uh, that he believed the decision making and the makeup of appointments in Number Ten just wasn't fit for purpose. Your view was that the cabinet at that time was designed to place Dominic Cummings and the Prime Minister as the decision makers. Yeah. The goal was to centralise power in Number Ten, with a preference for loyalty over experience. Yes, that's how I felt uh, things were. They were very centralised. And did that result in other ministers, including cabinet ministers, being excluded from decision making? I think sometimes it would have. And of course, you know, Sajid Javid actually resigned as Chancellor in February 2020, partly because of the makeup of number 10. In fact, he went further to say that Dominic Cummings being in number 10 was uh, really not working. He said that he felt that Dominic Cummings was trying to be Prime Minister all but in name. And that was where he felt that the elected Prime Minister uh, wasn't having a chance to make the decisions that were needed to be made. It's, it's not unusual, first of all, to, to get a request from, from the Prime Minister's office, from Number 10. It's not unusual at all, of course. Uh, but a lot of those requests, once probed, weren't actually coming from the Prime Minister. They, on, on probing further, they would be coming from Mr Cummings. And, and on many occasions, uh, when I would then eventually meet the Prime Minister and talk with him, and he would sometimes just not even know that that request had come in his name. And of course, lots more questions to come uh, from Sajid Javid this afternoon, not least on how those decisions were made. Of course, we heard yesterday that Boris Johnson was a fan of playing out the arguments in front of him rather than uh, looking at at some of the other options on the table. Uh, He wanted to see them. It was a gladiatorial decision-making process that we heard he liked to see in front of him. Now, of course, this is all reflecting on uh, what happened previously. It is also playing into politics now. We've seen the Prime Minister telling MPs today that he did not say that people should die of COVID or be allowed to die from COVID as has been heard during evidence in the COVID inquiry. Of course, he'll have his turn to give evidence in the coming weeks, we understand, before Christmas, as will Boris Johnson. And of course, we've got Matt Hancock up before the inquiry tomorrow and potentially also into Friday as well. Fantastic stuff uh, from Fraser Knight there, uh, making sense of some very sort of complicated and even occasionally contradictory evidence from various key players in the country's response to COVID. But I'd probably the standout point, the, uh, is it even an allegation or, or is it a reminder from Sajid Javid that Dominic Cummings and quite possibly Boris Johnson thought that Dominic Cummings was the real prime minister and that um, Boris Johnson was simply there as a, as a puppet or a tool through which Cummings' is diabolical genius could influence the future of these islands. Uh, If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also, of course, pause and rewind live radio. You'll find all of LBC's shows there to catch up on, as well as the best video clips from LBC and other global stations. Pause and rewind live radio on Global Player, where you're always in control. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Tom Sorbrick with you at four, but now on LBC, it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.